Section 22 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education Series, Volume 6, Towards a Philosophy of Education, by Charlotte Mason, A Liberal Education in Secondary Schools. Mighty is the power of persistent advertisement. The author of The Pagan may or may not be bringing an indictment against Pelhamism, but without any doubt, Pelhamism is bringing an indictment against secondary education. Half a million souls, judges and generals, admirals and barristers, are protesting that they have not been educated. No doubt the spirit that informs advertisements is often a lying spirit, but claims so well attested as these may have something in them, and we who are engaged in secondary education are uneasy. Again, we have the Board of Education desiring that return should be made promptly of all schools, not already in communication with the state, which, by the way, is taking paternal action in several directions to secure a liberal education for all His Majesty's lieges. Pay the schoolmaster well and you will get an education, is the panacea of the moment. And so we get in one neighborhood a village schoolmaster with a salary of 350 pounds and a house, and a singularly able curate, an Oxford man, with a wife and family and no house, who flourishes on 150 pounds a year. Work, however, is more than wages, and this exclusive stress on high salaries is a tacit undervaluing of teachers. Most of us know of fine educational work being done with little inducement in the way of either pay or praise. The real drawback to a teacher's work, and the stumbling block in the way of a liberal education, is the monotonous drudgery of teaching continually what no one wants to learn. Before the war, the president of the British Association complained that education was uninteresting alike to pupils, teachers, and parents. That is why we are always learning and never knowing, and why teachers exert themselves to invent a play way, why handicrafts, eurythmics, and the like are offered, not as adjuncts too, but as substitutes for education, why our public schools are exhorted to change their ways and our lesser private schools are threatened with extinction. And with all this, the intelligence and devotion, the enthusiasm and self-sacrificing zeal of teachers, generally is amazing. They realize that education is not merely an interest, but a passion. And this is true not only of the heads and the staffs of great schools, but of those hundreds of little private schools scattered over the country. We have all heard of the two Miss Prettymans, who kept a girls' school at Silverbridge. Two more benignant ladies than the Miss Pettymans never presided over such an establishment. As for Miss Annabella Prettyman, the elder, it was considered that she did all the thinking, that she knew more than any other woman in Barsetshire, and that all the Prettyman schemes for education emanated from her mind. It was said, too, by those who knew them best, that her sister's good nature was as nothing to hers, that she was the most charitable, the most loving, the most conscientious of schoolmistresses. To be sure, Miss Anne, the younger sister, knew more about Roman history and Roman law than about current history and English law. But what would you have? Here was a type of school with which the Trollop was familiar generations ago and perhaps it would not be hard to find such another school in every silver bridge of today. Today, however, we are uneasy, and in our unrest produce Joan and Peter, types of education. Small schools indulge in freaks, and great schools with much reason to believe in themselves are aware of a hitch somewhere, for they fail to turn out many boys or girls who have intellectual interests 
or have that flexibility of mind which Matthew Arnold tells us their academy gives to our neighbors across the channel. There is that bugbear of Pelmanism, urging a charge of inadequacy against our methods. There is always some new book by a man who brings railing accusations against his particular school. And here is a tempered protest from Colonel Weckington, which is telling. When I look back upon Eaton schooling, I regard it with mixed feelings, for I loved my five years at Eaton, gloried in its beauties and traditions, and was in upper division when I left. But all the same, I was conscious that Eaton was not teaching me the things that I wanted to know, and was trying to teach me things that revolted me particularly mathematics and classics. I wanted to learn history, geography, modern languages, literature, science, and political economy. And I had a very poor chance at Eton of obtaining anything but a smattering of any one of them. I do not agree that we learned nothing or were lazy. We worked very hard, but at what, to my mind, were useless things, and, with my feet planted firmly in the ground, I resisted in a mulish way all attempts to teach me dead languages and higher mathematics. I believe that I was right. Classics have left nothing with me but some ideas that I could have learned better from a crib. Probably the writer is mistaken as to what he owes to Eaton. Without those five years, he might not have become the authority on the theory and practice of war. He is admitted to be. Who knows how much Caesar may have influenced him as a small boy. No doubt public schools have many defects, but they also have the knack of turning out men who do the work of the world. We know about the playing fields, but perhaps when all is said, it is the tincture of the classics that every public school boy gets which makes him to differ. Nevertheless, such protests as Eaton was not teaching me the things I wanted to know, deserved consideration. It is easy to condemn the schools, but the fact is, a human being is born with a desire to know much about an enormous number of subjects. How was the school timetable to get them all in, or an adequate treatment of any one of them? Then, boys and girls, too, offer a resisting medium of extraordinary density. Every boy resists in a mulish way, attempts to teach him not only dead languages and higher mathematics, but literature and science and every subject the master labors at. With the average boy, a gallon of teaching produces scarce a gill of learning. And what is the master to do? It is something to know, however, that behind all this mulishness, there is avidity for knowledge not so much for the right sort, every sort is the right sort, but put in the right way, and we cannot say that every way is the right way. I put before the reader what we, of the PNEU, have done towards the solution of this educational problem with sincere diffidence, but also with courage, because I know that no persons are more open to conviction on reasonable grounds then our distinguished headmasters and mistresses. May they, if convinced, have the courage of their convictions. So little is known about the behavior of mind that it is open to anyone to make discoveries in this terra incognita. I speak not of psychology, of which we hear a great deal and know very little, but of mind itself, whose ways are subtle and evasive. Nevertheless, that education only is valid, which has mind for its objective. The initial difficulty is the enormous field of knowledge to which a child ought to be introduced in right of his human nature and of those firstborn affinities, which he lives to make good. First and chiefest is the knowledge of God, to be got at most directly through the Bible. Then comes the knowledge of man, to be got through history, literature, arts, civics, ethics, biography, the drama and languages. And lastly, so much knowledge of the universe as shall explain to some extent the phenomena we are familiar with 
and give a naming acquaintance at any rate with birds and flowers, stars and stones. Nor can this knowledge of the universe be carried far in any direction without the ordering of mathematics. The program is immense and school life is limited. What we may call the academic solution of the problem is teach a boy to know one thing thoroughly, say, Greek or chemistry or mathematics, and you give him the key to all knowledge. Therefore, we are told, it is not what you know that matters, but how you learn it. And a grammar grind, a mathematics grind, or a laboratory stunt, with a few odd matters thrown in, is supposed to answer all the purposes of education. The plan answers fairly well with the dozen best boys and girls in any school, because these are so keen and intelligent that they forage for themselves in various directions. But it does not answer with the average pupil, and he is coming in for his share of public attention. Shortly we shall have a new rule. Every school must educate every scholar in the three sorts of knowledge proper to him as a human being. What is knowledge? Someone will say, and there is no cat, neatly framed answer to be given. Only this we can assert. Knowledge is that which we know, and the learner knows only by a definite act of knowing, which he performs for himself. But appealing in curia blocks the way. Boys and girls do not want to know, therefore they do not know, and their future intellectual requirements will be satisfied by bridge at night and golf by day. It has come to us at the parents' union school to discover great avidity for knowledge in children of all ages and of every class, together with an equally remarkable power of attention, retention, and intellectual reaction upon the pablum consumed. The power which comes into play in the first place is, of course, attention, and every child of any age, even the so-called backward child, seems to have unlimited power of attention which acts without mark, prize, place, praise, or blame. This fact, clearly recognized, opens great possibilities to the teacher, though his first impulse be to deny statements which seem to him sweeping and absurd. But the education of the future will probably offer us intellectual assets in human nature, as surprising as the ethical values exhibited by the war. We have not attained what I think we are on the way to attainment. After over a quarter of a century of experiment on a wide scale and consequent research, we have discovered what children are able to know and desire to know, what their minds will act upon in the ways of judgment and imagination, what they are incapable of knowing, and under what conditions knowledge must be offered to them. We do not want a playway nor need we substitute arts and crafts or eurythmics or even rugger and the swimming bath as things that boys take to, whereas learning goes against the grain. Physical and mechanical training are necessary for the upbringing of the young, but let us regard them for the moment as training rather than education, which ought to concern itself with things of the mind. Education, as we know, it is admirably designed to develop the faculties, but if all that's an exploded ID, if there be no faculties to develop, but only mind, alert, self-active, discriminating, logical, capable alike of great flights and of minute processes, we must necessarily alter our educational tactics. Mind is benefited by occasional gymnastics just as is brother body, but cannot subsist on these any more than body can live on Swedish drill. As I have said, knowledge, that is, roughly, ideas clothed upon with facts, is the proper pablum for mind. This food a child requires in large quantities and in great variety. The wide syllabus I have in view is intended in every point to meet some particular demand of the mind. And the curious thing is that in a syllabus, embracing a score of subjects, the young learner is quite unconfused, 
makes no hollers, and never makes a say, a fact of English with a fact of French history. Again, we have made a rather strange discovery, that the mind refuses to know anything except what reaches it in more or less literary form. It is not surprising that this should be true of children and persons accustomed to a literary atmosphere, but that it should be so of ignorant children of the slums points to a curious fact in the behavior of mind. Persons can get up the driest of pulverized textbooks and enough mathematics for some public examination, but these attainments do not appear to touch the region of mind. When we get a young Pascal, who enters voluntarily and eagerly into the study of mathematics. He finds himself in a region of high thinking and self-existent law of the very nature of poetry. Minds of this caliber assert themselves, but this is a gift and does not come of plodding. For the general run of scholars, probably, the association of headmistresses are right, and a less exacting standard should be set for public examinations. Of natural science, too, we have to learn that the way into the secrets of nature is not through the barbed wire entanglements of science, as she is taught, but through field work or other immediate channel, illustrated in illuminated books of literary value. The French Academy was founded to advance science and art, a fact which may account for the charming lucidity and the exquisite prose of many French books on scientific subjects. The mind is a crucible, which brings enormous power to act on what is put into it, but has no power to distill from sand and sawdust the pure essence of ideas. So much for the manner of food which that organism, if I may be allowed the figure, called the mind, requires for its daily subsistence. How various this sustenance must be, I have already indicated, and we remember how urgently Dr. Arnold insisted on very various reading in the three parts of knowledge, knowledge of God, of man, and of the universe. But the mind was a deceiver ever. Every teacher knows how a class will occupy itself diligently by the hour and accomplish nothing, even though the boys think they have been reading. We all know how ill we could stand an examination on the daily papers over which we pour. Details fail us. We can say, did you see such and such an article, but are not able to outline its contents. We try to remedy this vagueness in children by making them take down and get up notes of a given lesson. But we accomplish little. The mind appears to have an outer court into which matter can be taken and again expelled without ever having entered the inner place where personality dwells. Here we have the secret of learning by rote, a purely mechanical exercise of which no satisfactory account has been given, but which leaves the patient or pupil unaffected. Most teachers know the dreariness of piles of exercises into which no strain of the personality has escaped. Now there is a natural provision against this mere skimming of the ground by the educational plow. Give children the sort of knowledge that they are fitted to assimilate, served in a literary medium, and they will pay great attention. What next? A clever questionnaire? Questions, as Dr. Johnson told us, are an intrusion and a war. But here we have a word of ancient wisdom for our guidance. The mind can know nothing except what it can express in the form of an answer to a question put by the mind to itself. Observe not a question put by an outsider, but put by the mind to itself. We all know the trick of it. If we want to tell the substance of a conversation, a sermon, a lecture, we go over it in our minds first. And the mind puts its question to itself, the same question over and over again, no more than, what next? And lo, we have it, the whole thing complete. We remember how one of Burke's pamphlets, by no means light affairs, was told almost verbatim at a college supper. 
We admire such a feat and think it quite out of our reach, but it is the sort of thing that any boy or girl of fifteen could do if allowed to read the pamphlet only once. A second reading would be fatal, because no one can give full attention to that which he has heard before and expects to hear again. Attention will go halt all its days if we accustom it to the crutch. We as teachers offend deeply in this matter. We think that we shall be heard for our much speaking, and we repeat and enforce, explain and illustrate, not altogether because we love the sound of our own voices, but because we depreciate knowledge, we depreciate children, and we do not understand that the mind and knowledge are as the two members of a ball and socket joint, each of them irrelevant without the other. Education will have turned over a new leaf once we realize that knowledge is to the mind as food is to the body, without which the one faints and flags and eventually perishes as surely as does the other. The way to bring this panacea into use is exceedingly simple. Let the child, up to any age while he is an infant in the eye of the law, tell what he has read in whole or in part on the instant, and again in an examination paper months later. Mere verbal memory, some reader will say, and there is no answer to be given but that which one must give to oneself. Let the objector read an essay of Lamb's say, or of Matthew Arnold's Lycidas, or the raven scene in Barnaby Rudge, and then put himself to sleep, or while away an anxious or dull hour by telling to himself what he has read. The result will be disappointing. He will have forgotten this and that turn of thought, link in the chain of argument, but he will know the whole thing in a surprising way. The incidents, the figures, the delicate play of thought in the author will be brought out in his mind like the figures in the low relief which the sculptor produces from his block. He finds he has taken in mind stuff, which will come into use in a thousand ways perhaps as long as he lives. Here we get the mind forces which must act continuously in education. Attention, assimilation, narration, retention, reproduction. But what of reason, judgment, imagination, discrimination, all the core of faculties in whose behoof the teacher has hitherto labored? These take care of themselves and play as naturally and involuntarily upon the knowledge we receive with the tension and fixed by narration as do the digestive organs upon duly masticated foodstuff for the body. We must feed the mind as the body fitly and freely and the less we meddle with the digestive processes in the one as in the other, the more healthy the life we shall sustain. It is an infinitely great thing, that mind of man, present in completeness and power in even the dullest of our pupils, even of him it may be said. Darkness may bound his eyes, not his imagination. In his bed he may lie, like Pompey and his sons, and all quarters of the earth, may speculate the universe, and enjoy the whole world and the heritage of himself. We are paying in our education of today for the wave of materialism that spread over the country a hundred years ago. People do not take the trouble to be definitely materialistic now, but our educational thought has received a trend which carries us whither we would not. Any apostle of a new method is welcome to us. We have ceased to believe in mind, and though we would not say in so many words that, the brain secretes thought as the liver secretes bile. Yet the physical brain, rather than the spiritual mind, is our objective in education. Therefore, things are in the saddle and ride mankind, and we have come to believe that children are inaccessible to ideas or any knowledge. The message for our age is, believe in mind, and let education go straight as a bolt to the mind of the pupil. The use of books is a necessary corollary, because no one is arrogant enough to believe he can teach every subject in the full curriculum 
with the original thought and exact knowledge shown by the man who has written a book on perhaps his life study. But the teacher is not moved by arrogance, but by a desire to be serviceable. He believes that children cannot understand well-written books and that he must make of himself a bridge between the pupil and the real teacher, the man who has written the book. Now we have proved that children, even children of the slums, are able to understand any book suitable for their age. That is, children of eight or nine will grasp a chapter in Pilgrim's Progress at a single reading. Children of fourteen, one of Lamb's essays, or a chapter in Eothin. Boys and girls of seventeen will tell Lycidas, Given a book of literary quality suitable to their age, and children will know how to deal with it without elucidation. Of course, they will not be able to answer questions, because questions are an impertinence which we all resent. But they will tell you the whole thing with little touches of individual personality in the narrative. Perhaps this is the key to the enormous difficulty of humanistic teaching in English. We are no longer overpowered by the mass of the humanities, confronted with the slow process of getting a child to take in anything at all of the author he is reading. The slow process is an invention of our own. Let the boy read and he knows, that is, if he must tell again what he has read. This of telling again sounds very simple, but it is really a magical, creative process by means of which the narrator sees what he has conceived. So definite and so impressive is the act of narrating, that which has been read only once. I dwell on the single reading because, let me repeat, it is impossible to fix attention on that which we have heard before and know we shall hear again. Treat children in this reasonable way, mind to mind not so much the mind of the teacher to that of the child, that would be to exercise undue influence, but the minds of a score of thinkers who meet the children, mind to mind, in their several books, the teacher performing the graceful office of presenting the one enthusiastic mind to the other. In this way, children cover an incredible amount of ground in the time at their disposal. Perhaps there is no better way of measuring a person of liberal education than by the number of substantives he is able to use with familiarity and discrimination. We remember how Scott tried a score of openings with the man on the coach and got no further until he hit upon bent leather. Then the talk went merrily for the man was a saddler. We have all had such experiences and know to our shame that we ourselves have victimized interlocutors who have not been able to find our particular bent leather. Now, this is a matter for teachers to consider. There are a thousand subjects on which we should have definite knowledge and be able to speak with intelligence. And indeed, we do not set general knowledge papers with the result that boys and girls are out for scrappy information and provide material for comic paragraphs. There is no remedy for this state of things, but a great deal of consecutive reading from very various books, all of some literary value. And this, we find, can be accomplished readily in school hours, because one reading is sufficient. Nor should there be any revision for the distant examination. Here is an uncorrected list of 200 names, used with ease and fitness in an examination, on one term's work by a child of eleven in Form two, Abinadab, Athenian, Anne Boleyn, Act of Uniformity, Act of Supremacy, America, Austria, Alcibiades, Athens, Auckland, Australia, Alexandria, Alhambra, Bible, Bishop of Rochester, Baron, Bean Shoots, Bluff, Bowen Falls, Bishoprics, Blind Bay, Morano, Currents, Cupid, Catholic, Court of High Commission, Cramer, Charles V, Colonies, Convent, Claude, Calais, Cook Strait, Canterbury Plain, Christchurch, Cathedral, Canals, 
Tale of, of Egypt, Court of the Myrtles, Columbus, Cordova. David, Defender of the Faith, Duke of Guise, Dunedin, Doge's Palace. England, Emperor, Empire, Egmont, Count, English Settlement. Flower, Fruits, French, Francis I, Francis of Guise. Ferdinand, Fauve Street, Fuchsias, Fjords, Ferns. Greek, Germany, Gondolas, Gates of the Damsels, Gondoliers, Granada, Gate of Justice, Gypsies. Henry VIII, History, Hooper, Henry II, Hungary, Haeckel. Israel, Italian, Language, Italy, Infusoria. Jesse, Jonathan, Joseph, John, Jerusalem, James, James Seymour. King of Denmark, King of Scotland, Kiwi. Love in Idleness, Lord Chancellor, Lord Burley, Lord Robert Dudley. Lyme, Littleton, New Zealand, Lake Tango. Mary, the Virgin, Moore, St. Thomas, Music, Martyrs Memorial. Milan, Metz, Monastery, Mary, Queen of Scots. Mediterranean, Microscope, Messina, Middle Island, Mount Egmont, Mount Cook, Milford Sound. Museum, Moa, Maurice, Musselman, Moorish King. Naomi, Netherlands, Nice, New Zealand, North Ireland, Napier, Nelson. Oberon, Oxford, Orion. Pharisees, Plants, Parliament, Puck, Pope, Protestant, Poetry, Philosophy, Pez, de Dames, Philip II, Paris, Planets, Pink, Terraces, Piazzetta, Philip of Burgundy, Queen Catherine, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mary, Queen Isabella, Queen Juana, Ruth, Robin Goodfellow, Ridley, Reformation, Radio Laria, Rotomaliana, Lake, Rhea, Saul, Samuel, Simon, Simon Peter, Sunshine, Sugarcane, Spices, Sultan, Spain, St. Quentin, Socrates, Stars, Sycamore, Seedball, Stewart Island, Seaport, Southern Alps, Scotch Settlement, St. Mark, St. Theater, St. Maria Formosa, Church, Sierra Nevada, Temple, Titania, Testament, Treaty, Turks, Tool, Thread Slime, Tree Ferns, Timber Trees, Trieste, Toledo, Ferder, Venus, Planet, Volcano, Volcanic Action, Venice, Wheat, Wiltshire, William Cecil, Walsingham, Winged Seed, Wellington, Waikato, Zacharias Zebedee. The fitness and simplicity with which these substantives are employed is evidenced in the complete sets of papers that follow. Supposing we have succeeded in shifting a conscientious and intelligent teacher from one mental position to another. Suppose that he give up the notion of developing faculties because he perceives that mind is complete and sufficient and wants nothing but its proper pablum. That again, he yielded his place as the medium of all knowledge because his boys are qualified to deal with knowledge at first hand from the right books. Suppose he scrap all the textbooks and compendiums he has in use, perceiving that only curious outsider, the verbal memory, and not the mind, will consent to deal with these dry as dust compilations. Suppose he concede that much knowledge of various sorts and therefore a wide curriculum is necessary for the production of an intelligent and magnanimous citizen. Supposing he has proved that any boy can face such a curriculum, because all boys have immense power of attention and are able to know their work after a single reading. Surely he has still one or two strongholds that have not been attacked. What he aims at, he will tell you, is not to open avenues of approach to the subjects about which intelligent citizens should know something, but to give pretty thorough knowledge in two or three directions and to turn out straight Englishmen. That is, he looks upon school as a nursery for the formation of character 
rather than for the acquisition of knowledge. As for the one or two subjects, practically, classics and mathematics, I have nothing to say. Those subjects are of real value and also under existing regulations, pretty high attainments in them are necessary as a preliminary to professional advancement. It is possible that when a boy has the habit of covering the ground rapidly, he may get more in the given period and leave a margin for the wider range of subjects proper to a liberal education. Experiments in this direction are being tried in one of our great grammar schools. And how important such experiments are to us as a democracy, I need not be at pains to show. There is every promise that the masses will learn to read in their schools in such wise as to produce in a terminal examination as considerable a list of names as those on the preceding page. If the masses know, Sancho Panza, Elsinore, Excalibur, Rosinante, Mrs. Jalabi, Redstart, Beavis, Bogbean. The classes must know these things, too, with easy intimacy. If the one class is familiar with the pictures of the Van X, with Comos and Duessa, Baron of Bradwardine, the other class must know them, too, and be able to use the knowledge with such effect as does the honorable member when he quotes a familiar tag from Horace. He touches a spring to which all hearts rise, because allusions to what we know are like the light on old familiar faces. What we want is a common basis of thought, such a groundwork as we get from having read the same books, grown familiar with the same pictures, the same musical compositions, the same interests. When we have such a fundamental basis, we shall be able to speak to each other, whether in public speaking or common talk. We shall all hear, in our own tongue, the wonderful works of God, because we have learned a common speech through those who in their books have lived to educate the race. And how persuasively shall we speak to those who know, and therefore do not present the dead front of opposition, the natural resource of ignorance. A democratic education must have new features. We must all be able to take the front of men and women by speaking of that which they have known and felt and already found joy in. So shall we cease to present motives of self-interest and personal advantage as incentives to public action. We shall touch springs of poetry, of heroism, to which all natures have the habit of rising, and thus shall we build Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Towards this, we must have read the same books, only in English rather than Latin or Greek, because the people will probably never have time to attain proficiency in these. Neither, as a matter of fact, has the average boy at our great schools. If we must still have an exclusive education to which only the few best in a school can attain, and it seems to me that we must, that this is, in fact, the one thing we have achieved, an education that has accomplished great results in character and conduct. But if we could keep this possession, we must at the same time broaden its base and narrow its bounds. We must give wide reading in the lower forms, reading that everybody has read, and we must so compress our classical and mathematical work in the higher forms that much history and English may be included. I speak without authority, but is it not true that there is overlapping in the passage from preparatory to public school, from one form to a higher, from the sixth to the university? Probably it will be found possible to give the old training which has produced such notable results, but to make it an inclusive, not an exclusive education. To take in the books which everyone should know, the pictures everyone should be familiar with, the history, the travel, in which we should all be at home, some understanding of the phenomena which come before us all. Once we give up the notion that education is a development of the faculties to be accomplished by the teacher, that it is on the contrary an appropriation of wide knowledge which the pupil must get for himself, there is some fear that the old exclusive education must go by the board, 
but this would be a national calamity. We must keep that to which we have attained and add to it the wide reading of a liberal education. The careers of Joan and Peter, as depicted by Mr. Wells, are instructive. Peter is not entered for a recognized public school for his guardian, had many things against such schools, but games are his chief concern. Later we find the two at college, and of Joan it is said, no religion has convinced her of a purpose in her life. Neither High Morton nor Cambridge has suggested any mundane devotion to her, nor pointed her ambitions to a career. The only career these feminine schools and colleges recognized was a career of academic success and teaching. The implicit charge against the schools is that they try, each in its own way, to find a substitute for the saving grace of knowledge. Academic success and knowledge are not the same thing, and many excellent schools fail to give their pupils delight in the latter for its own sake, or to bring them in touch with the sort of knowledge that influences character and conduct. The slow, imperceptible sinking in of high ideals is the gain that a good school should yield its pupils. We have, if not a higher, yet another standard, which it may be interesting to consider. We offer children knowledge for its own sake, and our pupils discover that studies serve for delight. We do not give our best attention to brilliant children. It is not necessary. These work well on their own account, and so do the average and even the dull pupils. Historical characters become real to them, and a fairly wide historical field comes under their purview. They do not grow up in crass ignorance of the history of foreign countries. They understand, for example, the India of today the better, because they have some slight intimacy with Akbar. As a contemporary of Elizabeth, they take to themselves a lesson from the youthful presumption of Phaeton, Midas and Circe, Xerxes and Pericles enrich the background of their thoughts. The several forms get through a great deal of reading because we have discovered that a single reading suffices to secure a clear knowledge, as far as it goes, of a subject, given the right book. Therefore, many books are necessary, and each is read consecutively, so that the knowledge acquired is not scrappy and insecure. I know that teachers enjoy the work set term by term fully as much as do the children, and that a schoolroom life in which there is no monotony, no dullness, little or no idleness or inattention, does away with the necessity to make games the paramount interest of the school, to make them indeed a stern necessity rather than a joyous relaxation. The introduction of the methods I advocate has a curious effect on a whole family. The old nurse and the gardener are told of the adventures of Waverley. A.B. has named a moss her father picked on the tip-top of the Ben Lars. It is very rare and only grows on Ben Lars and one on the mountain. She is so pleased, and so, no doubt, is her father. The whole household thinks of and figures to itself great things, for nothing is so catching as knowledge and that fine temper of mind that knowledge brings with it. Children so taught are delightful companions because they have large interests and worthy thoughts. They have much to talk about, and such casual talk benefits society. The fine sense, like an atmosphere, of things worth knowing and worth living for, this it is which produces magnanimous citizens, and we feel that Milton was right in claiming magnanimity as the proper outcome of education. When we compare the large numbers of books, of historical and literary personages, the range of natural phenomena with which children brought up on these lines are acquainted with the sterile syllabus, not very well mastered, which is the schoolboy's normal fare. We find matter for reflection. Yet I suppose that in few things is the general moral and intellectual progress evidenced more than in the culture common among the teachers of secondary schools. Every head knows how to draw up the best possible syllabus and to secure good work. 
if upon narrow lines, what we, of the PNEU, work at an advantage when, as I have said, we recognize one or two natural laws. I have no doubt that some of our readers are interested in the work we are doing in elementary schools, a work the more astonishing because children who have little vocabulary to begin with, no trace of literary background, show themselves able to hear or read a work of literary value, and after a single reading, to narrate pages with spirit and accuracy, not hedging at the longest names, not muddling complicated statements. This was a revelation to us, and it signifies that a literary education is open to all, not after tedious and laborious preparation, but immediately. The people wait only for the right books to be put into their hands and the right method to be employed. Let me repeat that we live in times critical for everybody, but eminently critical for teachers, because it rests with them whether personal or general good shall be aimed at, whether education shall be merely a means of getting on, or a means of general progress towards high thinking and plain living, and therefore an instrument of the greatest national good. Let me beg that heads of school so far in sympathy with me, that they perceive we are at the parting of the ways, will consider a method which brings promise of relief. We are in a condition, for example, to answer the questions to be considered by the Departmental Committee on English. Can history and literature be brought into closer relations with the school curriculum than in the case at present? How much grammar is necessary? Could not oral composition and drama and debate do something to cure our national aphasia? How can the preparatory schools improve their English teaching? How can the school essay be redeemed from barrenness? How can examinations be made a test of English without destroying the love of literature? These questions might have been framed with a view to bring out the attainments of the parents' union school. History, European as well as English, runs in harness with literature. Some syntax is necessary, and a good deal of what may be called historical grammar, but not in order to teach the art of correct writing and speaking. This is a native art, and the beautiful consecutive and eloquent speech of young scholars in narrating what they have read is a thing to be listened to not without envy. As to aphasia, to quote a director of education on this subject, Conversational readiness becomes a characteristic. A quarter of a century of these methods with all the children of England, and the strong, silent Englishman shall be a rare bird. A schoolmaster remarks that his big boys are now eager to speak at some length, a thing new in his experience. Consider what an asset this should be to a country whose safety will depend more and more upon the power in the middle classes of clear and conclusive speech. Oral composition is the habit of the school from the age of six to eighteen. Children of ten who read Shakespeare is the heading of an article in a local newspaper which sent a reporter to investigate the PNEU method at work in a school as the result of an article in the nineteenth century and after written by the headmaster. As for preparatory schools, we can do no more than offer them a method, the results of which in teaching English are rather surprising. The final question as to how examinations may be made a source of intellectual profit is, I think, sufficiently answered in the PUS children's examination papers. We do not invite heads of school to take up work lightly, which implies a sound knowledge of certain principles and is faithful a practice. The easy tolerance which holds smilingly that everything is as good as everything else. That one educational doctrine is as good as another. That, in fact, a mixture of all such doctrines gives pretty safe results. This sort of complacent attitude produces lukewarm effort and disappointing progress. I feel strongly that to attempt to work this method without a firm adherence to the few principles laid down would be not only idle but disastrous. 
Oh, we could do anything with books like those, said the master. He tried the books and failed conspicuously because he ignored the principles. We teachers are really modest and diffident and are not prepared to say that we are more capable of handling a subject than is a carefully chosen author who writes especially upon that subject. Yes, but, says a young and able teacher, we know better how to reach the minds of children than does the most eloquent author speaking through the dull pages of a book. This is a contention of which we have finally disposed. We have shown that the mass of knowledge, evoking vivid imagination and sound judgment, acquired in a term from the proper books, is many times as great, many times more thoroughly visualized by the scholars. Then had they waited upon the words of the most able and effective teacher. This is why we insist upon the use of books. It is not that teachers are not eminently capable, but because information does not become knowledge unless a child perform the act of knowing without the intervention of another personality. Heads of schools are a generous folk, and perhaps they have some reason to think parents are niggardly. But the provision of the necessary books by the parents is a sine qua non. It is our part to see to it that books take root in the homes of our scholars, and we must make parents understand that it is impossible to give a liberal education to children who have not a due provision of very various books. Moreover, it is impossible to teach children to spell when they do not read for themselves. We hear complaints of the difficulties of spelling, of the necessity to do violence to the language which is dear to us all, in order to make spelling made easy. But in thousands of cases that come before us, we find that children who use their books for themselves spell well because they visualize the words they read. Those who merely listen to their teacher have no guide, in English at any rate, to the spelling of the words they hear. We are, perhaps, opposed to oral lessons or lectures except by way of occasional review or introduction. For actual education, children must do their own work out of their own books under the sympathetic guidance of an intelligent teacher. We find, I may add, that once parents recognize how necessary a considerable supply of books is, they make no difficulty about getting those set in our programs. Mr. Fisher says, there are books and textbooks, and the day is at hand when we shall all see that the latter are of no educational value. We rarely use textbooks in the parent union school, but confine ourselves as far as possible to works with the imaginative grasp, the touch of originality, which distinguish a book from a textbook. Perhaps we should apologize for ourselves as purveyors not precisely of books, but of lists of books. Every headmaster or mistress is able to draw up such lists. But think of the labor of keeping some 170 books in circulation with a number of changes every term. Here is our excuse for offering our services to much-occupied teachers. There has been talk from time to time about interfering with the liberty of teachers to choose their own books, but one might as well contend for every man's liberty to make his own boots. It is one of those questions of the division of labor which belong to our civilization. And if the question of liberty be raised at all, why should we not go further and let the children choose their books? But we know very well that the liberty we worship is an elusive goddess and that we do not find it convenient to do all those things. We are at liberty to do. The terminal examinations are of great importance. They are not merely and chiefly tests of knowledge, but records which are likely to be permanent. There are things which every child must know. Every child for the days have gone by when the education befitting a gentleman was our aim. The knowledge of God is the principal knowledge, and no teaching of the Bible which does not further that knowledge is of religious value. Therefore the children read, or if they are too young to read for themselves, the teacher reads to them. A passage of varying length covering an incident or some definite teaching. 
if there are remarks to be made about local geography or local custom, the teacher makes them before the passage has been read, emphasizing briefly but reverently any spiritual or moral truth. The children narrate what has been read after the reading. They do this with curious accuracy and yet with some originality, conveying the spiritual teaching what the teacher has indicated. Now, this is no parrot exercise, but is the result of such an assimilation of the passage that it has become a part of the young scholar. It is only by trying the method oneself on such an incident, for example, as the visit of Nicodemus or the talk with the woman of Samaria, that we realize the wonderful clearness with which each incident is brought out, the fullness of meaning with which every phrase is invested by such personal effort. This method of teaching is especially valuable in dealing with the gospel history, but none of us who read during the war the daily lessons appointed by the church could fail to be struck by the fact that the law and the prophets still interpret the ways of God, and we shall not do well if we tacitly treat the Old Testament as out of date as a guide to life. Next in order to religious knowledge, History is the pivot upon which our curriculum turns. History is the rich pasture of the mind, which increases upon the knowledge of men and events, and, more than all, upon the sense of nationhood, the proper corrective of the intolerable individualism of modern education. Let Amiot tell us. How greatly is the reading of histories to be esteemed, which is able to furnish us with more examples in one day, than the whole course of the longest life of any man is able to do, insomuch that they which exercise themselves in reading, as they ought to do, although they be but young, become such in respect of understanding of the affairs of this world, as if they were old and gray-headed and of long experience. Yea, though they never have removed out of their houses, yet are they advertised, informed and satisfied of all things in the world. Hence the great value of the Old Testament, history and poetry, the law and the prophets, and perhaps no one was more sensible of this educative value of the scriptures than Goethe, though he was little sensible of their more spiritual worth. We endeavored to bring records contemporary with the Bible before children using the contents of certain rooms of the British Museum as a basis. Episodes of Greek and Roman history come in, partly for their historical, partly for their distinctly ethical value. Plutarch is, of course, our great authority. Plutarch hath written the profitable story of all authors, for all other were fain to take their matter, as that fortune of the countries whereof they wrote fell out. But this man, being excellent in wit, learning, and experience, hath chosen the special acts of the best persons of the famousest nations of the world. North. English history is always with us, but only in the earliest years is it studied alone. It is not, as we know, possible always to get the ideal book, so we use the best we can find and supplement with historical essays of literary value. Literature is hardly a distinct subject, so closely is it associated with history, whether general or English, and whether it be contemporary or merely illustrative. And it is astonishing how much sound learning children acquire when the thought of an age is made to synchronize with its political and social developments. A point which I should like to bring before the reader is the peculiar part which poetry plays in making us aware of this thought of the ages, including our own. Every age, every epoch, has its poetic aspect, its quintessence, as it were, and happy the children who have a Shakespeare, a Dante, a Milton, a Burns, to gather up and preserve its meaning as a world procession. Let me repeat that what is called composition is an inevitable consequence of this free, yet exact use of books, and requires no special attention until the pupil is old enough to take naturally a critical interest in the use of words. Civics takes place as a separate subject, 
but it is so closely bound up with literature and history on the one hand, and with ethics, or what we call everyday morals, on the other, that the division of subjects is only nominal. We have considered in a previous chapter what we do for children as inhabitants of a world ordered by natural law. Here we have a contention with some teachers of science who maintain that a child can only learn what he discovers for himself de novo. The theory is plausible, but the practice is disappointingly narrow and inexpansive. The teacher has got his knowledge through books. Why then are they taboo for the children? Probably the reason is that textbooks of science are desiccated to the last degree, so the teacher hopes to make up for their dryness by familiar talk about the hydra, for example, as a creature capable of close friendships, about the sea anemone as a granny of enormous longevity. That is, the interest of the subject is made to depend upon side issues. The French scientists know better. They perceive as there is an essence of history, which is poetry, so there is an essence of science to be expressed in exquisite prose. We have a few books of this character in English, and we use them in the PUS in conjunction with fieldwork and drawing, a great promoter of enthusiasm for nature. I have already shown what we do, for example, in the way of affording children familiar acquaintance with great music and great pictures. An eminent art dealer in London paid us a pretty compliment when he said, Lord, help the children. Were our work to come to an end, and he had reason, for he had sold to P.U.S. children thousands of little exquisite reproductions of certain pictures by Velasquez, which were the study of the term. No wonder that a man who loves art and believes in it should feel that something worthwhile was being done. In drawing, the scholars work very freely in color from natural figures and objects and draw scenes visualized in the terms reading. We do not teach drawing as a means of self-expression. The scholars express not themselves, but what they can see and what they perceive. I have already gone into the teaching of languages, the habit of fixed attention and ready narration, which the PUS pupils acquire should be of value in this branch of work. And I believe a new era is opening for us, and we English will at last become linguists. At the House of Education, the students narrate in French, more readily and copiously than they do in English. The courses of lecture in French history and literature which form part of their work in German and Italian, they are able to read a scene in a play and tell the scene in character or a short passage from a narrative. We rather emphasize Italian. The language is so beautiful and the literature so rich, and I should like to suggest that schools should do the same. Latin and Greek we learn in the usual ways, but we apply the method of narration to the former. I must commend any further study of the rationale of our syllabus to the reader's own kind consideration. He will perceive that we have a principle of correlation in things essential, but no fatiguing practice of it in detail. But to one more statement, a very daring one, I beg for favorable attention. The common theory and practice of education are on trial. It is idle to develop the faculties, if there be no faculties, but only mind, which, like Wordsworth's cloud, moves altogether when it moves at all. Therefore, those subjects whose raison d'etre is to develop this and the other faculty are practically out of court, and we must seek another basis for education. Subjects of instruction which would be valuable if reason, judgment, imagination had to be developed become as meretricious, as much accomplishments as those early Victorian accomplishments over which we make merry. Education must be in touch with life. We must learn what we desire to know. Nobody talks to his friend about stinks, about the niceties of Greek accents, nor, unless the two be mathematicians, about surds. But when Jupiter is regnant, how good to tell and to learn. 
or a welcome companion is he who can distinguish between songs that differ in the vespers of the birds. How grateful the company of the reader of history who brings forward parallels to episodes in the Great War. We are apt to work for one thing in the hope that we shall get another, and a very different thing. We don't. If we work for public examinations, the questions in which must be of a narrow academic cast, we get a narrow, accurate, somewhat sterile type of mind. We reap as we have sown. The future of England depends largely upon secondary schools. Let the heads of these lay out a liberal field of study, and astonishingly fair things will grow in that garden of mind, in which we are invited to sow the seeds of all knowledge. My bold proposal is that the heads of secondary schools, from the least to the greatest, should adopt a schedule of work following the lines I have indicated, faute de mieux, that of the parents' union school, and that they should do this for the nation's sake. Mr. Maysfield remarks, there can be no great art without great fable. Great art can only exist where great men brood intensely on something upon which all men brood a little. Without a popular body of fable, there can be no unselfish art in any country. Shakespeare's art was selfish till he turned to the great tales in the foremost popular books of his time. Hollinshed, Norse Plutarch, Cynthia, and de Belfort. Since the newspaper became powerful, topic has supplanted fable and subject comes to the artist untrimmed and unlit by the vitality of many minds. It is this vitality of many minds that we aim at securing and entreat educational workers and thinkers to join in forming a common body of thought, which shall make England great in art, no doubt, and also great in life. This is the way to make great men, and not by petty efforts, to form character in this direction or in that. Let us take it to ourselves that great character comes out of great thoughts, and that great thoughts must be initiated by great thinkers. Then we shall have a definite aim in education. Thinking and not doing is the source of character. Section 23 of Home Education Series, Volume 6 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education Series, Volume 6, Towards the Philosophy of Education, by Charlotte Mason. The Scope of Continuation Schools A hundred years ago, about the close of the Napoleonic Wars, there was such another stirring among the dry bones as we are aware of today. All the world knew then, as now, that war was the outcome of the wrong thinking of ignorance, and that education was the nostrum for minds diseased. Prussia led the way. Not the children, but the young people, were the immediate concern of statesmen. And guided by the philosophy of Fichte, and organized under the statesmanship of Stein, the Noble League of Youth, the Dungerbund, came into being. Prussia was miserably impoverished, but her concern was not with the arts which should make her rich. Her young people looked to philosophic principles for precept and to history for example, and it was well with the land. Not only in Prussia, but throughout Western Europe, there was a more or less active intellectual renaissance, but whether because the times were not ripe or the peoples were not worthy, the high ideals of the early days of the century were superseded by the utilitarian motive. When the continuation school movement revived, envy of the commercial and manufacturing successes of England actuated the new effort, and already in 1829, a Bavarian statesman had announced that if you would have the fruit, you must sow the seed. That is, manufacturing success is to be had only at the cost of technical education. We all know the result. In the great Munich schools where first-rate organization and admirable teaching have produced an appreciable effect upon German industries. 
but the best German minds have long been aware than an education which has powerful economic interests behind it is apt to become too narrowly utilitarian in motive and to lose that ideal element which gives all education its chief power over character. As Mr. Lecky has said concerning morals, the utilitarian theory is profoundly immoral. The occasion brought forth the man. We know how, in 1900, Dr. Kirschensteiner, chance to see the announcement of a prize offered for an essay on the best way of training youth. He wrote the essay, was crowned by the Academy of his country, and that essay in pamphlet form has influenced opinion and directed action throughout the West. Professors Dewey and Stanley Hall in the United States, Dr. Armstrong and Sir Philip Magnus at home, are among its leading exponents. And what was the note of this new gospel of education? Practically that same note which had proceeded from England, France, Switzerland, a century earlier. A utilitarian education should be universal and compulsory. Child and adolescent should be saturated with the spirit of service, provided with the instruments of effective self-direction. Behold, utopia at hand, every young person fitted, body and soul, for the uses of society. As for his own uses, what he should be in and for himself, why, what matter? It is not that the eminent educationalists I have referred to would willingly sacrifice the individual youth to society. On the contrary, they would raise him, give him place and power, give him opportunity place his feet on the rungs of that ladder we used to hear about. But we have all been misled by mistaken views as to the function of education. We have believed that knowledge may be derived from sensation, that what we have seen with our eyes and our hands handled affords us the nutriment our souls demand. No doubt a boy uses his mind to some purpose when he makes, for example, an ingenious model. And seeing mind at work, we run away with the notion that food and work are synonymous terms. For the body, they may be so in a certain sense. For work brings pay, and pay buys food. But no such indirect transaction is possible to the mind. A mind perpetually at heavy work is a sort of intellectual navvy whose food must be proportioned to his labor. Our great statesman, Gladstone, Lord Salisbury and others knew this, and their wide and deep reading in other matters than politics should not occasion surprise. The war has forced new ideas upon us. We begin, for instance, to realize the avidity of the adult mind for instruction. It was startling to read of 1,500 soldier candidates for 20 vacant places in a certain class. We begin to see that mind, the mind of all sorts and conditions of men, requires its rations, wholesome and regularly served. As things are, we shall have to see to it that everybody gets fed. But our hope is that henceforth we shall bring up our young people with self-sustaining minds, as well as self-sustaining bodies, by a due ordering of the process of education. We hope so to awaken and direct mind hunger that every man's mind will look after itself. What is the proper food of mind has already been discussed, but we may assume that education should make our boys and girls rich towards God. We remember the fool of the parable who failed because he was not rich towards God, rich towards society and rich towards themselves. I will not press my point by urging the moral bankruptcy, which has been exposed to us during recent years as coexistent with, if not caused by, utilitarian education. For the catastrophe has been accelerated by the sort of moral madness of which we too have had our sessions in the past. Witness our Barnaby Rudge and Peveril of the Peak episodes. We have indeed been carried off our feet by a fallacious notion once and again. 
but our national insanity has on each occasion been short-lived because our education hitherto has not taught us to believe a lie. We are not worse than others, and if we think well of ourselves as a nation, why, national pride and personal modesty do not go ill together. In peacetime, we have better things to say of our British working man, but all the same he compares favorably with the somewhat sardonic Latin, the sullen Teuton, whom we all know, and the better man does the better work. We have heard much of German efficiency, and perhaps the German excels in little matters like doors that shut, blinds that draw, springs that act, things of domestic utility important in a country, with a more extreme climate than ours. But these are little matters, and perhaps our failing is not to do our best except on big occasions. Give us a big job or a big war, and we show our mettle but probably in all our considerable industries we excel. German women will purr over the material of our dresses with, ah, English it took. Well, dressed men are English tailored in English clothes. We buy or bought things made in Germany because they were cheap, but the most costly and most desired goods in German shops are advertised as English. This is a point to be borne in mind in considering the education of adolescence. We are given to depreciating ourselves and each other, but in fact we have no leeway to make up. As both a manufacturing and commercial nation, we are well in the van and are without inducement to sell the people's birthright for a mess of pottage. Before I came to the point I decided to make, let us consider whether the problem of continuation schools has been attacked anywhere more successfully than in those countries of Middle Europe. Some of them, Germany especially, have done all that is to be done in response to the cry for efficiency with its resultant big returns and high wages. But from the beginning of the continuation school movement in, say, 1806, the four northwestern countries have worked towards different ends. In Denmark they have, not continuation schools, but people's high schools, a pleasanter name for possibly a pleasanter thing. Denmark, like Germany, was, as we know, devastated by the Napoleonic Wars, but had been vitalized by the liberation of its serfs in 1788. And this prepared the ground, for Grundtvig, that poet, historian, and enthusiast, who became the father of the people's high schools. Where there is most life, there is the victory, said he, and the immediate way to an access of life he saw in, a Danish high school accessible to young people all over the land, a school which should inspire admiration for what is great, love for what is beautiful, faithfulness and affection, peace and unity, innocent cheerfulness, pleasure and mirth. Observe, there is no word of efficiency in this poet's dream, but he did assure Charles the Eighth that with such a school, a well of healing in the land, he might afford to smile at the newspapers, whether they chose to praise or blame. The king gave heed, begged for a further development of his plans, then was afforded in the original pamphlet, and by 1845 the schools he had dreamed of began to be. We cannot follow the development of these Danish pupils' schools, but in 1903-4 to four, their pupils numbered over 3,000 men and rather more women, and wise men cherished the hope that the new Danish school for youth is to have the good fortune to blend all classes of the people into one. All of these high schools bear the mark of the genius of their father, whose pupils have known how to sum up his teaching in three sayings. Spirit is might. Spirit reveals itself in spirit. Spirit works only in freedom. We are able to trace the source of these sayings, and indeed this movement seems to have been from the first profoundly Christian. Christian in no narrow sense but sharing the wide liberality of that 
Allegoria Philosophica Delia Religia Only Catalytica, conceived by the angelic doctor and pictured by Simon Memmi on the walls of the Spanish chapel in Santa Maria Novella, Florence. The several teachers commemorated were themselves illustrious pagans, but not therefore the less under divine teaching. Here, it seems to me, is an educational credo worth reviving in these utilitarian days, and some such creed seems to have been Grunvich's, though probably independently conceived. His great hope is that, above all, some acquaintance with popular literature, especially with the poetry and history of one's own country, will create a brand new world of readers all over the land. I cannot go into the question of the agricultural schools, of which it is said that the Danish agricultural school is the child of the Danish Volkshundskola, and must, like this, have Christian faith and national life for its basis. In the careless days before the war, we could all testify to the excellence of Danish butter, but did we consider the resolution and capacity with which Danish peasants passed over from the making of poor butter in their various small holdings to the manufacture in cooperative dairies of butter of an almost uniform fineness? This, too, says an eminent Swedish professor, is due to the high schools, for, said he, just as the enrichment of the soil gives the best conditions for the seed sown in it, so a well-grounded humanistic training provides the surest basis for business capacity, and not the least so in the case of the coming farmers. These are weighty words deserving our consideration at a moment when we, too, are on the eve of a new departure. The three neighboring countries watched the experiments in Denmark with keen interest, and almost simultaneously people's high schools sprang up in all four. These northern high schools, necessarily winter schools, were not open at the time of my visit, but two or three things casually observed might, I think, be traced to their influence. For instance, Copenhagen itself, as compared with Munich strikes one as a city with a soul. At The Hague, again, I saw an artisan in his working clothes, chewing pictures in one of the galleries to his boy of seven, who looked earnestly and listened eagerly. The young people in the great Delft porcelain works showed traces of culture and gentleness in countenance and manner. But nothing struck me more than what I saw in the general shop of an out-of-the-way village in Sweden, the villagers were peasants, and the one shop sold cabbages and herrings, cheese and calico. But across the small paint window was a shelf closely packed with volumes and paper covers, which had not had time to get dusty. Of course, I could not read all the titles, but among them were translations from French, German, and English. I noticed them volumes of Scott, Dickens, Thackeray, Ruskin, Carlyle and the last thing out, one felt assured that the village was in kingdom come, that of a long winter's evening in any home. One read aloud, once the rest worked, that there was much to talk about when friends met and lovers walked. How sad, by the way, to read that Tommy, whom we all love and revere, is quick to form friendships, but that these do not progress for the friends have nothing to talk about. Think of little plays got up, of public readings given by the villagers themselves. Might such things be with us? The lore of the town would cease to draw our village men and maids, for the village that can offer a happy community life, sustained by the people themselves, is able to hold its people. Our upper and middle classes, professional and other, are singularly stable folk, and they are so not because of their material, but of their intellectual well-being. In this sense only, they are most of them the haves, as compared with the have-nots. The reason is not far to seek. Are there not agitators abroad whose business it is to sow seeds of discontent in the gaping minds of the multitude? The full mind passes on, but that which is empty seizes on any new notion with avidity 
and is hardly to be blamed for doing so. A hungry mind takes what it can get, and the baker is apt to be lenient about prosecuting the starving man who steals a loaf. I do not hesitate to say that the constantly recurring misery of our age, labor unrest, is to be laid at the door, not of the working man, but of the nation which has not troubled itself to consider the natural hunger of mind and the manner of meat such hunger demands. I have tried to establish that the culture offered by the Munich type of continuation school has had no good effect upon morals or manners and no conspicuously good effect upon manufactures. That England is under no necessity to follow Germany's lead in this matter, for Germany allows our superiority by paying a high price for our goods. That Denmark and the neighboring states, on the contrary, excel in those things in which we fall short. That the People's High School of Denmark are worthier of our imitation than the continuation schools of Germany. That they are so because character and conduct intelligence and initiative are the outcome of a humanistic education in which the knowledge of God is put first. But we cannot take educational prescriptions designed for another patient. The Grundfig schools are for students ranging from 18 to 25, not for the more difficult ages from 14 to 18. Again, these people high schools are residential. In countries so largely agricultural, it is possible for a great part of the young adult population to spend the five winter months year by year at one of these people's high schools. Their case and ours do not go on all fours. Our problem is the young adolescent in a country largely manufacturing. Now we have received our cloth, and not in ungenerous measure. How shall we cut our coat? That is, shall we spend those seven or eight hours a week in which education is to do her part for the young citizen? It will take the easiest way. We shall let the boy do what he is doing for the rest of the week. Work for his employer, whether directly by way of increased output or indirectly by way of increased skill. This would be a betrayal. No employer wishes to take with one hand what he gives with the other. Besides, one employer doubts the ability of his staff to train his young employees. Again, the technique of any employment takes but little time to understand. It is the practice that is of value, and such practice is work. Continuation schools should not exist for technical instruction. They are established definitely for the sort of education of which such instruction forms no part, and will not the evening hours be free, as they are at present for technical classes, gymnastic clubs, and various forms of recreative exercise. This particular gift of time must be dedicated to things of the mind if we believe that mind, too, requires its rations, and that to use the mind is by no means the same thing as to feed it. With the best will in the world to give boys and girls something on which to chew the cud, real mind stuff for digestion and assimilation, we find that the floodgates are opened. An ocean of things good to know overwhelms us, and we have eight hours a week. We seize on that blessed word compromise and see two possibilities. We are in a hurry to make good citizens. Now, good citizens must have sound opinions about law, duty, work, wages, what not. So we pour our opinions into the young people from the lips of lecturer or teacher. His opinions, which they are intended to take as theirs. In the next place, there is so much to be learned that a selection must needs be made. The teacher makes this selection, and the young people are poured into it like a bucket, which, says Carlyle, is not exhilarating to any soul. Some ground is covered. Teachers and education authorities are satisfied. And if, when the time comes, the young people leave school discontented and uneasy, if their work bore them and their leisure bore them, 
if their pleasures are mean and meager, and if they become men and women rather eager than otherwise for the excitement of a strike, that is because the continuation, as the elementary school, will have failed to find them. This is the real educational difficulty in schools for all classes, for pupils of all ages, the enormous field of knowledge which it is necessary to cover in order to live with intelligence and moral insight. Know one thing well, and you have the power to apprehend many things, is the academic solution, which has not worked altogether badly, but it cannot be stretched to fit over present occasion. The enlightenment of the masses, what we may call the academic doctrine, assumes that mind, like body, is capable of development in various directions by means of due exercise. Profounder educational thought, however, reveals mind to us as of enormous capacity, self-active, present in everyone and making but one demand, its proper pablum. Feed mind duly, and its activities take care of themselves. As the well-fed workman is fit for all his labors, so the duly nourished mind knows, thinks, feels, judges, with general righteousness. The good man and magnanimous citizen is he who has been fed with food convenient for him. Such a view of education naturally includes religion, not only for his God doth instruct him and doth teach him, but because we may take knowledge roughly as of three sorts. Knowledge of God, to be got firsthand through the sacred writings. Knowledge of man, to be arrived at through history, poetry, tale. Through the customs of cities and nations, civics. Through the laws of self-government, morals. One other great branch of knowledge remains. Every youth should know something of the flowers of the field, the birds of the air, the stars in their courses, the innumerable phenomena they come under general observation. He should have some knowledge of physics, though chemistry perhaps should be reserved for those who have a vocation that way. Here are we on the verge of that new life for our country, which we all propose, faced with infinite possibilities on either hand, the vast range of knowledge and the vast educability of mind. Another certainty presents itself, that we have not time for shortcuts. The training of muscle and sense, however necessary, does not nourish mind. And on the other hand, the verbiage of a lecture is not assimilated. There is no education but self-education, and only as the young student works with his own mind is anything affected. But we are not without hope. An astounding field has been opened to us. Thousands of children in council schools are doing incredible things with freedom and joy. They have taken in hand their own education and are greedy of knowledge for its own sake. Knowledge in the three great fields that I have indicated. The fact is that a great discovery has been vouchsafed to us, greater, I think, as concerns education than any since the invention of the first alphabet. Let us again refer to Coleridge on the origin of great discoveries. Coleridge gives no qualification to the minds which receive these great ideas. They are not described as great minds, but he says they are previously prepared to receive them, that is, the great ideas. If the reader will forgive me for saying so, I think my mind has been so prepared by extraordinary incapacity in one direction the direction, roughly, of academic attainments, and by some degree of capacity in other directions, and it has been gradually borne in upon me that this incapacity and this capacity are pretty general, and perhaps afford a key to the problem of education. A further preparation came to me in unusual opportunities for testing and understanding the minds of children and young people. I am anxious to bring this idea of a discovery before the reader because our methods are so simple and obvious that people are inclined to take them up at random and say that extensive reading is 
a good idea which we shall have all tried more or less, and that free narration is a good plan in which there is nothing new. It is true that we all read, and that narration is as natural as breathing, its value depending solely upon what is narrated. What we have perhaps failed to discover hitherto is the immense hunger for knowledge, curiosity, existing in every one, and the immeasurable power of attention with which every one is endowed. That every one likes knowledge best in a literary form, that the knowledge should be exceedingly various concerning many things on which the mind of man reflects. But that knowledge is acquired only by what we may call the act of knowing, which is both encouraged and tested by narration, and which further requires the later test and record afforded by examinations. This is nothing new, you will say, and possibly no natural law in action appears extraordinarily new. We take flying already as a matter of course, but though there is nothing surprising in the action of natural laws, the results are exceedingly surprising, and to that test we willingly submit these methods. All is not for all, was the sad conclusion of that Danish patriot and prophet. No doubt Grundvig thought of the impassable barriers presented by a poor and mean vocabulary and a field of thought without literary background. So, all is not for all, he said, even as a prophet of our own proclaims that a worthy education is only for the elite. Books are not for the people, was Grundvig's conclusion. Wherefore, those young Danes were lectured to by men of enthusiasm, who had their country's literature and history at their fingers' ends, and could convey the temper of their own minds. A great deal was affected, but minds nourished at the lips of a teacher have not the stability of those which seek their own meat. But what if it were all for all? If the great hope of Comenius, all knowledge for all men, were in process of taking shape, this is what we have established in many thousands of cases, even in those of dull and backward children that any person can understand any book of the right caliber, a question to be determined mainly by the age of the young reader, that the book must be in literary form, that children and young persons require no elucidation of what they read, that their attention does not flag while so engaged, that they master a few pages at a single reading so thoroughly that they can tell it back at the time or months later, whether it be The Pilgrim's Progress or one of Bacon's essays or Shakespeare's plays, that they throw individuality into this telling back so that no two tell quite the same tale, that they learn incidentally to write and speak with vigor and style and usually to spell well. Now this art of telling back is education and is very enriching. We all practice it. We go over in our minds the points of a conversation, a lecture, a sermon, an article, and we are so made that only those ideas and arguments which go over are we able to retain. Desultory reading or hearing is entertaining and refreshing, but is only educative here and there as our attention is strongly arrested. Further, we not only retain, but realize, understand what we thus go over. Each incident stands out. Every phrase acquires new force. Each link in the argument is riveted. In fact, we have performed the act of knowing, and that which we have read or heard becomes a part of ourselves. It is assimilated after the due rejection of waste matter. Like those famous men of old, we have found out knowledge meet for the people. And to our surprise, it is the best knowledge conveyed in the best form that they demand. Is it possible that hitherto we have all been like those other teachers of the past, who were children because they had taken away the key of knowledge, not entering in themselves and hindering those who would enter in? Today we are in this position. We realize that there is an act of knowing to be performed that no one can know without this act, 
that it must be self-performed, that it is as agreeable and natural to the average child or man as singing is to the song thrush that, to know, is indeed a natural function. Yet we hear of the incuria which prevail in most schools, while there before us are the young consumed with the desire to know. Can we but find out what they want to know and how they require to be taught? Humanistic education, whether in English or Latin, affects conduct powerfully. Knowledge of this sort is very welcome to children and young persons. A good deal of ground may be covered because a single reading of a passage suffices. This sort of humanistic work has been tried with good effect, and if our continuation schools are to be of value, they must afford an education on some such lines. The Parents' Union School, originally organized for the benefit of children educated at home, is worked by means of programs followed by examination papers sent out term by term. When the same work, if not the whole of it, was taken up by council schools, the advantage of such an organization was apparent, especially in that it afforded a common curriculum for children of all classes. By using this curriculum, we were enabled to see that the slum child in a poor school compares quite favorably with the child of clever or opulent parents who had given heed to his education. Now, one of our national difficulties is the fact that we have no common basis of thought or ground for reflection. No doubt, by pretty copious reading, links of common interest might be established, and the schoolroom might do at least as much for the general life as does the cricket pitch. The scheme works practically without a hitch in council schools. This is the sort of work that the highest class in these schools, in Standard 7, are doing with great success and very great delight. They read English, French, and general history, three or four volumes, two or three books dealing with citizenship and morals from various points of view, literature, contemporary with the history read, several works, natural history, physical geography and science, three or four books, scripture, chiefly the Bible. Every term brings a new program of work, the continuation usually of books already in reading. Children in secondary schools and in families remain for one year in Form 4, and that work seems adapted to the status of continuation schools for the first year or two. After that, the more advanced program, Forms 5 and 6, might be used in the same way. This work would appeal to young people as being unlike the ordinary school grind and as giving them opportunity for consecutive speaking and essay writing. There's probably no better test of a liberal education than the number of names a person is able to use accurately and familiarly as occasion requires. We all recollect the character of Miss Austin's, who had no opinion to offer as to whether the Bermuda should be described as the West Indies or not, because she had never called them anything in her life. Now here is an alphabetical, uncorrected list, taken from the examination papers of a girl of 13, containing 213 proper names, all of them used accurately, easily, and with interest. Amaziah, Ariel, Ayrshire, Arcot, America, Austrian Army, Artemidorus, Antium, Ophidius, Auditors, Apotheosis, Alte Mountains, Asawan, Africa, Altbara, Analosa, Arachnids, Armadillo, Albumen, Abdomen, Oracles, Angle, Arc. Burns, Robert, Bastille, Bombay, Bengal, Burke, Black Hole of Calcutta, Benevolence, Basalt, Butterfly, Beetles, Blood Vessels, Berber, Blue Nile, Baghdad, Burn, Jones, Cowper, Calcutta, Clive, Canada, Colonel Luttrell, Cleopatra, Candace, Coriolanus, Cassowary, Cormorants, Curlews, Cranes, Calypta, 
cotton grass, chalk, conglomerate, crustacea, cheiroptera, carnivora, chyle, center of circle, china proper, canton, Cairo, Cheops, Circe. Dick Primrose, Deserted Village, Duplex, Demotic Characters, Ducks, Despotic Government, Dr. Livingstone, Deposits, Delta, Diaphragm, Duodenum. England, East India Company, Economical Reform, Europe, Emperor of Austria, Empress of Russia, Emu, Eastern Turkestan, Egypt. France, Frederick the Great, Frederick William of Prussia, Flightless Birds, First Cataract, Foraminifera, Gadarenes, Gizeh, Great Commoner, George the Third, General Warrants, Governor General, Grace and Free Will, Greek Language, Generosity, Gulls, Granite, Grubs, Gastric Juice, Globules, Haldi, Highlands of Scotland, Herodotus, Hieroglyphics, Herons, Hong Ho, Hedgehog, Hydrochloric Acid, Hydrocarbons, Heart. Isaiah, India, Influence of Light. Josiah, Judah, Jehoshaphat, Jerusalem, Jonas, Jonah, Jesuits, Geminis, Japan. Kunensdorf, Kuhn, Luf Mountains, Kyoto, Kearney, Khartoum, Kohlberg, Kalabari. Lord North, Lords in Waiting, Of Love, Land Birds, Lamelli, Luxor, Lake Nagami, Luanda, Lake Nias, Manasa, Mongolia, Manchuria, Madras, Maharajas, Member of Parliament, Middlesex, Methodist, Mississippi Company, Maria Teresa, Mummies, Microscopic Shells, Membrane, Nagasaki, Nile, nitrogenous food. Olivia Primrose, ostriches. Pharisees, Primrose, Mrs. Philosophers, Plassey, Pitt, Prime Minister, Pragmatic Sanction, Prague, Peace of Hertelsburg, Pity, Puffins, Penguins, Plovers, Pelicans, Plants, Polytrichum, Formidum, Peristom, Porphyric, Paddingston, Pepsin, Peptone, Pancreas, Pulmonary Artery, Pania Plateau, Prairies, Pyramid, Portuguese West Africa, Quillamen, Rome, Rosbach, Rosetta Stone, Rhea, Rodentia, Sea of Galilee, Sophia Primrose, Saratus, Dowish, Seven Years' War, Silesia, Saxony, Secretary, Storks, Sandpipers, Seedlings, the Task, Treaty of Dresden, Tullus, Trade Unions, Trustees, Treasurer, Tropical Countries, Ulysses, Ungolata, Volcanic Eruptions, Vermes, Vertebrate, Villi, Ventricles, Verne Cava, Vicar of Wakefield, Vulgens, Vice President, Wallace, Walpole, War of Independence, Wicks, Whitfield, Wesley, War of the Austrian Succession, Waterbirds, Wadi Halls, Yangtze Kingang, Zonga, Zambezi, Zondorf. This is secondary work, but supposing the young people of a continuation school who could not read all the books on the programs got some degree of intimacy, some association with, say, 100 such names in a term, we might believe that they were receiving a liberal education. This is the sort of work we hope to see done in continuation schools by pupils from 14 to 16. The young people of the future between 16 and 18 should be prepared to work in Forms 5 and 6. It is not the best children that answer the examination questions. The general rule is that everybody takes every question. I have touched only on the more humanistic subjects, as whatever is done in mathematics, for instance. The head of the continuation school will no doubt arrange, and indeed so much has been done in the elementary school already, that probably the keeping of fictitious account books would be a sufficient exercise for young people who show some mathematical talent. 
no cost whatever is attached to the adoption and continued working on this method, except the cost of books, and of these, young wage earners would no doubt buy their own, so that by degrees each would form his little library of books that he has read, understands, and knows his way about. I should like to quote a few sentences from Professor Yukin on the education of the people. By education of the people, it must not for a moment be supposed that we mean a special kind of education. We do not refer to a condensed preparation of our spiritual and intellectual possessions, suitable for the needs and interests of the great masses. We are not thinking of a diluted concoction of the real draft of education, which we are so kind and condescending as to dispense to the majority. No, there is only one education common to us all. We can all unite in the construction of a spiritual world over against that of petty human routine. Thus there is, in truth, a possibility of a truly human education, and therefore of a true education of the people. The Gina professor sees clearly enough the task before us all, but he sees or sets forth no possible way of accomplishing it, nor is there any other way than that which we have set forth that can afford this sort of liberal education. The electric telegraph was not discovered twice over. After all our protests, we are in our way, utilitarian for no other study, is so remunerative as that of the humanities. Let me draw the reader's attention to one point. Instability, unrest, among our wage earners is the serious danger threatening our social life. Now it is said that nothing can act but where it is, and the class which acts steadily where it is, at some outpost of empire, on a home of state, in parliament, where you will, is the class educated at public schools, that is, men brought up on the humanities. Strong language will be used about the deadness and decadence of these men, although they do much of our national work. Their defects are obvious and manifold, but still, as I say, the public work that is done is, for the most part, done by men whom no one could describe as progressive. Is there not some confusion of ideas about this fetish of progress? Do we not confound progress with movement, action, assuming that where these are, there is necessarily advance? Whereas much of our activity is like the waves of the sea, going always and arriving never, what we desire is the still progress of growth that comes of root striking downwards and fruit urging upwards. And this progress in character and conduct is not attained through conditions of environment or influence, but only through the growth of ideas, received with conscious intellectual effort. It will be possible to have only a little of this strong meat in continuation schools. But a little goes a long way. How far our public school men illustrate? For a careful analysis will bring us to the conclusion that not Latin and Greek, games, athletics, or environment, but the humanities in English alone will bring forth the stability and efficiency which we desire to see in all classes of society. I have said that we have, after all, a generous allowance of cloth from which to cut our garment, seven or eight hours a week. In that time, we may get in, page for page, book for book, as full a complement of the humanities, poetry, history, essay, tragedy, comedy, philosophy, between the ages of 14 and 18, as our public men have imbibed at their schools. To be sure, these do it in the classic tongues, while for those there is only plain English. But however duly we magnify Greek literature, we cannot honestly say that that of England is second to any the world has yet seen. We can give to the people the thought of the best minds, and we can secure on their part the conscious intellectual effort, the act of knowing, which bears fruit in capability, character, and conduct. We cannot offer to the people the grace of scholarship in the allotted time, 
but no doubt, earnest souls will find a way to get this surpassing excellence also, if there be profit in grinding at grammar, that they must forego too. But the inspiration and delight of entering into an intellectual world full of associations, this they should have, a well of healing and fountain of delight. Now a common ground of thought is inestimable in what may be called its cohesive value, and what we desire to afford to the nation at large is such another background of thought, sketched in like that of the public schoolman from the books men and women had read at school, books which made them intimate with Pitt and Fox, Dick Swiveller, Mrs. Quickly, with daffodils and clouds and nightingales as the poets have seen them, with a thousand promiscuous and seemingly purposeless scenes and sayings which somehow combined to serve the purpose of a background throwing the thoughts and incidents of today into clear relief. For this reason, we, like the public schools, all read the same books with such an intensive single reading that for the rest of the lives of these young people, phrases or illusions they come across will kindle in their eyes that light which never was on sea or land. We may hope that public schools will presently add this modicum of English to their classical studies. Then the candidate for election, who will have something to appeal to, other than the desire to better himself, which is supposed to dominate every man. By the way, is the paucity of literary or historical allusions not in Latin to be heard in the house, due to the fact that the audience cannot be counted upon to rise to a reference not included in the well-known school books? If so, we shall change all that. Once the masses read, the classes must read too and the peace will be signalized by a new bond of intellectual life in common. There is no more dreadful sight, says Goethe, than ignorance in action, and is not this the sight that is at the present time dismaying us all? Demos is king today, and who may dispute his right? But let us all give him the chance to become that philosopher king, who, according to an ancient dream, was to be the fit ruler or rulers of the people. The hopeful sign is that Demos himself perceives his lack and clamors for the humanistic education in which he sees his salvation. Section number 24 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Danny Dyer. Home Education Series, Volume 6. Towards a Philosophy of Education by Charlotte Mason. The Basis of National Strength. A Liberal Education from a National Standpoint. Part 1. Knowledge. We have from time to time given some attention to the failure of our attempts to educate the average boy and it may be useful to look into one or two fundamental principles upon which this question and others seem to me to depend. For if our conceptions of education are heterogeneous and incoherent, naturally we shall have a tangle of examination schemes evolved to test our ill-conceived work. Educationally, we are in a bad way. We were told some time ago in Across the Bridges, of the rapid deterioration of the bright, intelligent, responsive schoolboy who has passed through the sixth and seventh standards. Why, we ask. Industrial unrest often reveals virtue, even heroism of a sort, in the working man, but a lamentable want of knowledge, lack of education. He appears to have little insight, imagination, or power of reflection. The tendency in his class is that dangerous tendency which we must all do our best to resist, indicated by Mr. Burns at a public meeting some few years ago. The spirit of the horde, he said, is being developed. And whether it is in exhibitions, sports, or legislation, the individual is becoming less and less important and the mob more and more so. And again, the tendency of the present day in all modern movements is for great crowds to be brought together to see other people play. 
and that is extending not only to play, but to other fields of life. Could the industrial movement of today be better diagnosed? Again we ask, why? As for those young men from public schools who fail in the dominions, enough has been said about them. But those other public school men who succeed in a measure at outpost of the empire because of the virtue that is in them, do they not fail sometimes in an equal measure for lack of the insight, imagination, intelligence, which come of knowledge? As for the people who stay at home, educated men and women, I write as an old woman who remembers how in the 60s and 70s, countenance was much talked of. An intelligent countenance, a fine countenance, a noble countenance, were matters of daily comment. The word has dropped out of use. Is it because the thing signified has dropped out of existence? Countenance is a manifestation of thought, feeling, intelligence. And it is none of these, but stolid indifference combined with physical well-being that we read in many faces today. If we have these grounds for discontent, education is no doubt the culprit at the bar. Though there never was, I suppose, a more heroic and devoted body of teachers at work. They get for themselves the greater blessing of those who give. But the children suffer, poor little souls. Poured into like a bucket, they receive without stint, and little comes of it. There is no lack of zeal on the part of the teaching profession, but there is a tendency amongst us to depreciate knowledge and to depreciate our scholars. Now, knowledge is the material of education, as flour is the material of bread. There are substitutes for knowledge, no doubt, as there are for flour. Before the era of free meals, I heard of a little girl in East London whose mother gave her a penny to buy dinner for herself and her little sister when the two set out for school. The child confided to her teacher that a half porth of aniseed drops stays your stomach more than a half penny bun. Now our schools are worked more or less upon aniseed drops, marks, prizes, scholarships, blue ribbons, all of which stay the stomach of the boy who does not get the knowledge that he needs. That is the point. He needs knowledge as much as he needs bread and milk. His appetite for knowledge is as healthy as his appetite for his dinner. And an abundant regular supply at short intervals of various knowledge is a constitutional necessity for the growing youth as well as for the curious child. Yet we stay his hunger pangs upon aniseed drops. We do worse. We say, what is the good of knowledge? Give a boy professional instruction whether he is to be a barrister or a bricklayer, and strike out from his curriculum Greek or geography or whatever is not of utilitarian value. Teach him to play the game and handle the ropes of his calling, and you have done the best for him. Now here is a most mischievous fallacy, an assertion that a child is to be brought up for the uses of society only and not for his own uses. Here we get the answer to the repeated question that suggested itself in a survey of our educational condition. We launch children upon too arid and confined a life. Now personal delight, joy in living, is a chief object of education. Socrates conceived that knowledge is for pleasure, in the sense not that knowledge is one source, but is the source of pleasure. It is for their own sakes that children should get knowledge. The power to take a generous view of men and their motives, to see where the greatness of a given character lies, to have one's judgment of present events, illustrated and corrected by historic and literary parallels, to have, indeed, the power of comprehensive judgment. These are admirable assets within the power of everyone, according to the measure of his mind. And these are not the only gains which knowledge affords. The person who can live upon his own intellectual resources, and never know a dull hour, though anxious and sad hours will come, is indeed inviolable in these days of intellectual inanition when we depend upon spectacular entertainments, pour passer le temps. If knowledge means so much to us, what is knowledge, the reader asks. We can give only a negative answer. Knowledge is not instruction, information, scholarship, a well-stored memory. It is passed, like the light of a torch, from mind to mind, and the flame can be kindled at original minds only. Thought, we know, breeds thought. It is as vital thought touches our minds that our ideas are vitalized, and out of our ideas come our conduct of life. The case for reform hardly needs demonstration, but now we begin to see the way of reform. 
the direct and immediate impact of great minds upon his own mind is necessary to the education of a child. Most of us can get into touch with the original minds chiefly through books. And if we want to know how far a school provides intellectual sustenance for its scholars, we may ask to see the list of books in reading during the current term. If the list be short, the scholar will not get enough mind stuff. If the books are not various, his will not be an all-around development. If they are not original, but compiled at second hand, he will find no material in them for his intellectual growth. Again, if they are too easy and too direct, if they tell him straight away what he is to think, he will read, but he will not appropriate. Just as a man has to eat a good dinner in order that his physical energies may be stimulated to select and secrete that small portion which is vital to him, so must the intellectual energies be stimulated to extract what the individual needs by generous supply and also by a way of presentation that is not obvious. We have the highest authority for the indirect method of teaching proper to literature and especially to poetry. The parables of Christ remain dark sayings. But what is there more precious in the world store of knowledge? How injurious, then, is our habit of depreciating children? We water their books down and drain them of literary flavor, because we wrongly suppose that children cannot understand what we understand ourselves. What is worse, we explain and we question. A few pedagogic maxims should help us, such as do not explain, do not question, let one reading of a passage suffice, require the pupil to relate the passage he has read, the child must read to know. His teacher's business is to see that he knows. All the acts of generalization, analysis, comparison, judgment, and so on, the mind performs for itself in the act of knowing. If we doubt this, we have only to try the effect of putting ourselves to sleep by relating silently and carefully, say, a chapter of Jane Austen or a chapter of the Bible, read once before going to bed. The degree of insight, the visualization, that comes with this sort of mental exercise is surprising. As I have said, a child in his seventh year will relate the Pilgrim's Progress chapter by chapter, though he cannot read it, and some half dozen other books are the best we can find for him. In his eighth or ninth year, he works happily with a dozen books at a time, books of history, adventures, travels, poems. From his tenth to his twelfth year, he reads considerable books of English and French history, seriously written. Shakespeare's historical plays, Norse Plutarch's lives, and a dozen other worthy books. As he goes up the school, his reading becomes wider and more difficult, but everyone knows the reading proper at the ages of 15, 17, 18. The right books are given, but not enough of them. The reading dietary is too meager for the making of a full man. A score of first-rate books should appear in the school curriculum term by term. The point that I insist upon, however, is that from his sixth year, the child should be an educated child for his age, should love his lesson books, and enjoy a terminal examination on the books he has read. Children brought up largely on books compare favorably with those educated on a few books and many lectures. They have generous enthusiasms, keen sympathies, a wide outlook, and sound judgment, because they are treated from the first as beings of large discourse looking before and after. They are persons of leisure, too, with time for hobbies, because their work is easily done in the hours of morning school. It is not necessary to speak of modern languages and mathematics, fieldwork and natural history, handiwork, etc. Schools are pretty much agreed about the treatment of these subjects. As for Latin and Greek, the teaching of these and the possibility of getting in any work beyond these is a crucial question. But I think it is open to public schoolmasters to discover that, given boys who have read and thought, and have maintained the habit of almost perfect attention that a child begins with, a necessary amount of work in the classics may be done in a much shorter time, and that the mind of the pupil is the more alert because it is engaged in handling various subjects. Perhaps, too, some enlightened headmaster may come to distinguish between scholarship and knowledge, a distinction which practical men, like Napoleon, for example, have known how to draw. Probably there never was a life on which the humanities exercised a more powerful influence. Rarely has there been such an example of the power of the informed mind to conquer the world. Napoleon is the final answer to the contention that a knowledge of books has no practical value. For there was, perhaps, no incident in his career that was not suggested, inspired, illustrated, 
by some historical precedent, some literary apothem. He was, as we know, no scholar, but he read diligently, even in the midst of absorbing affairs, Homer, the Bible, the Quran, poetry, history, Plutarch. Nations grow great upon books as truly as do individuals. We know how that heroic young queen, Louisa of Prussia, perceived the downfall of her country was not due to Napoleon alone, but also to national ignorance, and that if Prussia were to rise, it must be through the study of history. So she set herself to work at the history of modern Europe during that sojourn at Mamel, when she knew poverty as a peasant woman knows it. The disciples of Kant found a league of virtue to arouse Prussian students to the duty of patriotism. Fichte knew how to issue a trumpet call. The nation became a nation of students, and the son of Queen Louisa established the German Empire. Alas, that an age should have come when the humanities were prescribed on German soil, and humanity followed them into exile. A noble view of education was as righteousness exalting a nation, but, alas, we all know what universal havoc and disaster have proceeded from the debased and materialized theory of education promulgated at Munich. The Danes, again, as we all know, owe their rise out of illiteracy to the Napoleonic impulse. After we had seized their battleships by way of crippling the claws of Bonaparte, they set to work to make themselves the first farmers in Europe. This they have done in and through their schools and their continuation schools where they get not technical instruction, but a pretty wide course in history and literature. As for the Japanese revolution of some 50 years ago, history has little to show of a finer quality, and this again was the work of a literary people. If we would not be left behind by the East and the West, we must, as other nations have done, add to our virtue knowledge. And we are still competent, as some of these are not, to mount from the bottom rung of the apostolic educational ladder. It rests with us to add to our faith virtue and to our virtue knowledge. It is an unheard of thing that the youth of a great nation should grow up without those ideals, slow enough in maturing, which are to be gathered for the most part from wide and wisely directed reading. End of section 24. Read by Danny Dyer. Pendleton, South Carolina, July 20th. Section 25 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education Series, Volume 6. Towards a Philosophy of Education by Charlotte Mason. The Basis of National Strength A Liberal Education from a National Standpoint 2 Letters, Knowledge, and Virtue The following fragments of a valuable letter illustrate the contention of the foregoing chapter. There is one thing, however, one note of regret, and that is that one paragraph, that on classical education, was not more expanded. I am satisfied that your central view covers the whole truth, and I am going to give you a small individual experience illustrating this fact, viz. that an early education in the great books of our own language, read with enjoyment by children and appropriately given to them from year to year, is the true groundwork of later expansion. Here is the story. My three daughters were suckled on Walter Scott and Shakespeare. Later, about the ages from ten to twelve, off their own, they took up Plutarch's lives, Bunyan, Defoe, and in the same period they refused to learn arithmetic and geography, the former on the ground of its monotony, and the latter because, although they loved it, they held that the existing system of teaching geography was rotten and that geography ought to be learnt by going to the places. I knew better than to remonstrate. I meekly suggested that perhaps they would substitute something else in their curriculum, and they said it once, in an obviously prepared sentence. That's just it. We want to learn Latin and harmony. Now here goes your point in that lamentably abbreviated paragraph. Given boys or girls, 
who have read and thought, and who have maintained the habit of almost perfect attention that a child begins with. The necessary amount of work in the classics may be done in a much shorter time, and the mind of the pupil is the more alert because it is engaged in handling various subjects. Six months later, these girls knew more Latin than I learned in six years under distinguished scholars with very eminent names. They could sling passages from Horace appropriately. They knew the first two Ecologues and half of the Aeneid by heart. They regarded Cicero's letters to Atticus as a penny post affair and were quite unduly familiar with the private life of Seneca. But all this did not interfere with their painting or their horsemanship, and better authorities on cricket and the turf I don't happen to know. That is the illustrative episode. The point in my mind is that in early education from great books, with the large ideas and the large virtues, is the only true foundation of knowledge, the knowledge worth having. This interesting letter brings us straight to a question which I thought had been pretty fully threshed out, and I tackle it with diffidence, only because an outsider may see aspects overlooked by experts. The gist of the charges brought against public schools is, classics take up so much time that there is no opportunity for literary human areas in any other form. It is easy to say, gain time by giving up Greek, but in the first place, public schools, with our old universities in sequence, are our educational achievement. Other efforts are experimental, but this one thing we know, that men are turned out from this course who are practically unmatched for quality, culture, and power. Even the average B.A. shows up better than his compeers, and a degree in art signifies more than one in any other faculty. We return thus to my original contention that letters primarily are the content of knowledge, that if Wellington ever said how Waterloo was won, it was not on the playing fields only, but in the classrooms of Eton, that Caesar, Thucydides, Prometheus bound, have won more battles than we know on fields civil and military. A little strong meat goes a long way. And even the average public school boy turns out a capable man. But alas, if capable, he is also ignorant. He does not know the history and literature of his own country or any other. He has not realized that knowledge is not a store, but rather a state that a person remains within or drops out of. His degree taken, he shuts his books, reads the newspapers a little, perhaps a magazine or two, but otherwise occupies himself with the interests of sports, games, shows, or his employment. What is to be done, we wonder vaguely, to secure to this average boy some tincture of knowledge and some taste for knowledge? The expedient of dropping Greek to make room for other things recurs. But on reflection we say, no, for culture begins with the knowledge that everything has been known and everything has been perfectly said these two thousand years ago and more. This knowledge, slowly drummed into a youth, should keep him from swelled head, from joining in the we are the people cry of the blatant patriot. And there is no better way of knowing a people than to know something of their own words in their own speech. It is well, by the way, that we should remember that we have as a nation an enormous loss to make good. Time was, and not so long ago, when rich and poor were intimately familiar with one of the three great classical literatures. Men's thoughts were colored, their speech molded, their conduct more or less governed by the pastoral idols called Genesis, the impassioned poetry of Isaiah, the divine philosophy of John the rhetoric of Paul, all writings like the rest of the Bible, in what Matthew Arnold calls the grand manner. Here is the well of English undefiled, from which men have drawn the best that our literature holds, as well as their philosophy of life, their philosophy of history, and that principal knowledge we are practicing to do without, 
the knowledge of God. And we wonder that the governing classes should forget how to rule as those who serve, and that the working man, brought up on readers, in lieu of a great literature, should act with the obstinate recklessness proper to ignorance. But to return to the main issue, how shall we instruct the ignorance and yet retain the classical culture of the average public school boy? I should like to suggest again, with diffidence, that he, like his more brilliant compeer, is driven through a mill, the outpour of which should be scholarship. Now, scholarship is an exquisite distinction which it would be ill for us as a nation to miss. But if all the men in an assemblage were decorated, who would care to wear an order? Some things are precious for their rarity, and to put a school in the running for this goal is as absurd as the ambition of the little boy who meant to be a knight of the garter when he grew up. The thing is not to be done. Some men are born to be scholars, as the shape of their heads testifies. The rest of us take pleasure in their decoration, but are not envious. For scholarship is not the best thing, and does not necessarily imply that vital touch of mind upon mind, out of which is got knowledge. As for every edition, we may leave that out of count. It is hardly even an aim at the present time. The geniuses, as one to some thousands, say of our best, do not trouble themselves much about the regimen we offer, classics or modern languages, or what not. An idle tale, a puppet show, the meanest flower that blows is enough for them. Anyway, they take care of themselves and we come back to the average boy. He must learn his Greek and Latin, but there is an easier way. The girls mentioned it in the letter I cite had hit upon it that favorite girl pupil of Vittor Reno's, who spoke and wrote Greek with remarkable purity at twelve, having, so to speak, done with Latin at an earlier age. She, we may be sure, had not been through the grammar school grind, nor had any of the learned ladies of the Italian and French Renaissance, the list of whose accomplishments leaves us breathless. While still children, we know how early they married, their knowledge of the classics was copious and not too wholesome. They knew two or three modern languages, could treat the wounded, nurse the sick, prepare simples, govern great households, ride to chase, yes, and kill too, and do exquisite embroidery. Our own women of the Toga times appear likewise to have been infinitely informed and to have carried their learning gaily. Maria Teresa, by no means a learned lady, could make speeches and converse with her Magyar nobles in Latin, and they could respond, neither knowing the native speech of the other. If these things were true of girls and women, how much more was expected of boys and men? Are we persons of less intelligence, or how did they do it all? Every preparatory school knows how. Perhaps few boys enter public schools who could not pass respondions, that is, who are not, as far as Greek goes, ready for Oxford. I once heard a headmaster say, A boy does as much Latin now by the age of twelve as he will have need for examination purposes, and he spends the next eight years in doing over again and again the same work. A clever boy of twelve could easily pass respondions. A headmaster in Newfoundland mentions in his school report for 1905 a boy who began Greek in October and passed the Oxford Responsions in January. There is a leakage somewhere, and there is overlapping, and both are due to the examinations upon which scholarships are awarded. Something must be done, because public schools, with all their splendid records, are not effective in the sense that they turn out the average boy a good all-round man. For better or for worse, who knows? The democracy is coming in like a flood, and our old foundations will be tossed about in the welter unless we make haste to strengthen our weak places. Might not a commission, consisting of two or three headmasters, as many preparatory schoolmasters, university dons and public men, 
Once public school boys and now the fathers of such boys look into the question and devise examination tests which shall safeguard letters, ancient and modern, without putting too high a premium upon scholarship. Once the hands of schoolmasters were united, they would no doubt devise means by which our friend, the average boy, would get such knowledge of the classics as should open lifelong resources to him. Like the Baron of Bradwardine, he would go about with a pocket livy, as he would say, Titus Livius, to be read, not labored at a few lines at a time. The Seven Against Thebes, Iphigenia in Aulis, the few tragedies left to us by the great dramatist would form part of the familiar background of his thoughts. He would know somewhat of the best that has been written in Greek and Latin, whether through printed translations or through the text itself, rendered in the sort of running translation which some masters know how to give. Parry Passu, he would do his share of Geron grind, and construe the two or three books of his present limited acquaintance. But his limitations would be recognized, and he would not be required to turn out Greek and Latin verse. Meantime, his master will require him to know, pretty intimately, a hundred worthy books in addition to the great novels, to be read in class periods, in vacation, and in leisure time, his knowledge of each to be tested by a single bit of oral description or written work in verse or prose. Ground he at grammar, sums up every successful schoolboy's record, as it did that of the dead grammarian, but the ten or twelve years of school life should yield more than this. I say nothing now about the teaching of science, for which most schools provide, except that for our generation. Science seems to me to be the way of intellectual advance. All the same, the necessity incumbent upon us at the moment is to inculcate a knowledge of letters, men and their motives, the historical sequence of events, principles for the conduct of life. In fact, practical philosophy is what the emergencies of the time require us to possess and to be able to communicate. These things are not to be arrived at by any shortcut of economics, eugenics, and the like, but are the gathered harvests of many seasons, sowing of poetry, literature, history. The nation is in sore need of wise men, and these must be made out of educated boys. Section 26 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education Series, Volume 6, Towards a Philosophy of Education, by Charlotte Mason. The Basis of National Strength, A Liberal Education from a National Standpoint, 3, Knowledge, Reason, and Rebellion. We have been very busy about education these sixty years or more, diligently digging, pruning, watering. But there is something amiss with our tree of knowledge. Its fruits, both good and evil, are of a mean, crabbed sort, with so little to choose between them that superior persons find it hard to determine which is which. To examine the individual apples would be a long process, but let me take one at a venture. Is it not true that a conviction of irresponsibility characterizes our generation? If this be true, seeing that we all think as we have been brought up to think, our education is at fault. Faulty education is to blame if private property be recklessly injured in broad day, if working men do vital injury to their country thinking to serve their caste, if there be people who love to have it so as long as their own interests are immune. The melancholy fact is that the people who do damage to private property, to public interest, and to that more delicate asset of a nation, public opinion, are all by way of being educated in their several degrees. All of them can write and speak clearly, think logically, if not sincerely, and exhibit a certain practical ability. It is true that the war has changed much 
and has brought us a temporary salvation. But education must secure to us our gains, or the last state of the nation may be worse than the first. No doubt we are better and not worse than our forefathers, and where we err, it is through ignorance. Through ignorance ye did it, was said of the worst crime that men have done, and that appalling offense was wrought for no worse reason than because it is the habit of more or less lettered ignorance to follow specious arguments to logical conclusions. The sapient East knows all about it. Lady Lugard tells us how. The cops have a saying that, in the beginning when God created things, he added to everything its second. I go to Syria, said reason. I go with you, said rebellion. We need not follow the other pairs that went forth, but still reason is apt to be accompanied by rebellion when it sets out in search of a logical issue. For it is a fatal error to think that reason can take the place of knowledge, that reason is infallible, that reasonable conclusions are of a necessity right conclusions. Reason is a man's servant, not his master, and behaves like a good and faithful servant, a sort of Caleb Palderstone, ready to lie royally in his master's behoof and bring logical demonstration of any premise which the will chooses to entertain. But the will is the man, the will chooses, and the man must know if the will is to make just and discriminating decisions. This is what Shakespeare, as great a philosopher as a poet, set himself to teach us, line upon line, precept upon precept. His Leontes, Othello, Lear, Prospero, Brutus, preach on the one text, that a man's reason brings certain infallible proofs of any notions he has willfully chosen to take up. There is no escape for us, no shortcut. Art is long, especially the art of living. In the days when the working man represented only the unit of his family, he picked up enough knowledge to go on with at church and chapel by scrutinizing his neighbor's doings in the village parliament held at pump or public from the weekly news sheet. But we have changed all that. Bodies of working men have learned by means of union to act with a momentum which may be paralyzing or propelling according to whether the men have or have not knowledge. Without knowledge, reason carries a man into the wilderness and rebellion joins company. The man is not to be blamed. It is a glorious thing to perceive your mind, your reasoning power, acting of its own accord as if it were, and producing argument after argument in support of any initial notion. How is a man to be persuaded? When he wakes up to this tremendous power, he has of involuntary reasoning. That his conclusions are not necessarily right, but rather that he who reasons without knowledge is like a child playing with edged tools. Following his reason, he acquires this and the other sort of freedom. But is it not written? Nor yet, grave this upon thy heart, if spiritual things be lost through apathy or scorn or fear, shalt thou, thy humbler franchises support, however hardly won or justly dear. If, then, the manners and the destinies of men are shaped by knowledge, it may be well to inquire further into the nature of that evasive entity. Matthew Arnold helps us by offering a threefold classification which appeals to common sense. Knowledge of God, knowledge of men, and knowledge of the natural world, or, as we should say, divinity, the humanities, and science. But I think we may go further and say that letters, if not, as I said before, the main content of knowledge, constitute anyway the container, the wrought salver, the exquisite vase, even the alabaster box to hold the ointment. If a man cannot think without words, if he who thinks with words will certainly express his thoughts, what of the monosyllabic habit that is falling upon men of all classes? The chatter of many women and some men does not count, for thought is the last thing it is meant to express. 
the Greeks believed that a training in the use and power of words was the chief part of education, recognizing that if the thought fathers the word, so does the word in turn father the thought. They concerned themselves with no language, ancient or modern, save their own, but of that they acquired a consummate appreciation. With the words came the great thoughts, expressed in whatever way the emergencies of the state called for, in wise laws, victorious battles, glorious temples, sculpture, drama. For great thoughts anticipate great works, and these come only to people, conversant with the great thoughts that have been written and said. In what strength did the youngest and greatest of our premiers bring about the revival of England? He was fortified by illimitable reading, by a present sense of a thousand impossibilities that had been brought to pass, of a thousand things so wisely said that wise action was a necessary outcome. To say that we as a nation are suffering from our contemptuous depreciation of knowledge is to say that we scorned letters, the proper vehicle of all knowledge. Let us glance at the three departments of knowledge to see in regard to which, of the three, we are most in error. Some of us are content with such knowledge of divinity as is to be picked up from the weekly sermon heard in church. But even with the qualification of a degree in arts, I wonder, do our divines lift us as much as they might into that serena region where words fitly spoken beget thoughts of peace and holy purpose. That worship is the main end of our church services is a sublime ideal, but the way without which there is no going, the truth without which there is no knowing, the life without which there is no living, must needs be set before us in words that burn, and we wait for preachers like those of a bygone day, whose pulpit thunder shook a nation's soul. It is possible that the church may err in keeping us underfed upon that knowledge, which is life. But she does not send us away empty. We get some little share, too, of literature, poetry, history. A phrase, a line, lights up a day for us. To read of Charles Fox's having said, Poetry's everything, of that black conqueror of the Sudan who said, without learning life, would have neither pleasure nor savor. These things do us good. We cannot tell why. But there is a region of apparent sterility in our intellectual life. Science says of literature, I'll none of it. And science is the preoccupation of our age. Whatever we study must be divested to the bone, and the principle of life goes with the flesh we strip away. History expires in the process. Poetry cannot come to birth. Religion faints. We sit down to the dry bones of science and say, Here is knowledge, all the knowledge there is to know. I think that is very wonderful, a little girl wrote in an examination paper, after trying to explain why a leaf is green. That little girl had found the principle, admiration, wonder, which makes science vital. And without wonder, her highest value is, not spiritual, but utilitarian. A man might as well collect matchboxes, like those charming people in one of Anatole France's novels. As such, for diatoma, unless the wonder of the world be ever fresh before his eyes. In the 18th century, science was alive, quick with emotion, and therefore it found expression in literature. Still, a lister, a pastor, moves us, and we feel that in one department of science anyway, men stirred by the passion of humanity, letters at the fountainhead, are doing monumental work. But for the most part, science, as she is taught, leaves us cold. The utility of scientific discoveries does not appeal to the best that is in us, though it makes a pretty urgent and general appeal to our lower avidities. But the fault is not in science. That mode of revelation which is granted to our generation, may we reverently say, but in our presentation of it, by means of facts and figures and demonstrations, that mean no more to the general audience than the point demonstrated, 
never showing the wonder and magnificent reach of the law unfolded. The Hebrew poet who taught us that bread corn is bruised because his God doth instruct him and doth teach him glorified life. Coleridge has revealed the innermost secret, whether of science or literature, speaking on the genesis of an idea he says, when the idea of nature, presented to chosen minds by a higher power than nature herself, etc. The man who would write for us about the true inwardness of wireless telegraphy say, how truly it was a discovery, a revealing of that which was there and had been there all along, might make our hearts burn within us. No doubt there are many scientific men who are also men of letters, and some scientific works as inspiring as great poems. But science is waiting for its literature, and though we cannot live in shameful ignorance and must get what we can out of the sources open to us, science as it is too commonly taught tends to leave us crude in thought and hard and narrow in judgment. We are told that in times of great upheaval, it profits not to cast blame on this or that section of the community, that we are all to blame even for the offenses of individuals, and we partly believe it because our fathers have told us. Thus did the prophets humble themselves before God and bemoaned each his exceeding great sin in the sin of his people. We, too, are meek under chastisements, but we are vague and, to that extent, insincere. Perhaps our duty is to give serious thought to the problems of our national life. Then we may come to realize that man does not live by bread alone. We may perceive that bread, or cake, is our sole and final offer to all persons of all classes, that we are losing our sense of any values excepting money values, that our young men no longer see visions and are attracted to a career in proportion as there's money in it. Nothing can come out of nothing, and if we bring up the children of the nation on sordid hopes and low ambitions, need we be surprised that every man plays for his own hand. We recognize now and then, when the shoe pinches, that the nation is in the throes of a revolution, but we do take trouble to find out the cause of industrial unrest and the correct attitude of the public towards that unrest. The revolution which is in progress may, it seems to me, develop on either of two lines. The men may get those humbler franchises they covet, but at the loss of spiritual things, such as the character of fair play, straight dealing, and loyalty to contract which we like to think of as distinctively English. But what about the warning that these humbler franchises will be likewise lost? Trade unionism is no new thing. Centuries ago, and for centuries as we know, England and Europe were under the dominion of those states within the state, the trades guilds. At this distance of time, we can afford to admire these, for the spiritual things to which they held fast, their religious organization, the thorough training they afforded to their apprentices, and the obligation every member of a guild was under to use just weights and measures and to turn out first-rate work of whatever kind. But, notwithstanding these moral safeguards, the tyranny of the guilds became insupportable, and they disappeared into the limbo of things no longer serviceable. Could any dream of socialism, again, offer more perfect conditions than did the Russian village communes? But these, too, established a tyranny, which was felt to be more oppressive than serfdom itself. The mere disappeared, lost in that Gehenna, which engulfed the gills. Wordsworth's prophetic lines should instruct us, however hardly won or justly dear, those humbler franchises for which men are standing out in their tens of thousands with unanimity, courage, devotion to a cause justified by their reason, they will not be able to support those same franchises if spiritual things, the real things of life, be lost in gaining them. Therefore, we may predict that the present movement may well issue in worse things but will not issue in the triumph of either trade unionism or syndicalism. 
Here is our opportunity. We blame the workmen for their irresponsible action, for what seems to us the reckless way in which the poorest are impoverished, and multitudes of workers are compelled to unwilling idleness. But those of us who are neither miners nor owners may not allow ourselves irresponsible thought or speech, and we may contribute our quota towards appeasement. It is within everybody's province to influence public opinion, if it be only the opinion of two or three. We may raise the whole question to a higher plane, the plane of those spiritual things, duty, responsibility, brotherly love towards all men, which make the final appeal. We could not, and we need not try to, obstruct the revolution of which we are vaguely conscious, but we may help to make it a turn of the wheel, which shall bring us out of the darkness of a simplin tunnel into the light and glory of a Lombard plain. We may, respecting the claims of working men, perceive that they demand too little, and that the things they demand are not those which matter. Even the shock of a revolution is not too high a price for an experience which should convince us that knowledge is the basis of a nation's strength. Section 27 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education Series, Volume 6. Towards the Philosophy of Education by Charlotte Mason. The Basis of National Strength. A Liberal Education from a National Standpoint for New and Old Conceptions of Knowledge I have so far advanced that knowledge is undefined and probably indefinable. That is a state out of which persons may pass and into which they may return, but never a store upon which they may draw. That knowledge hunger is as universal as bread hunger that our best provision for conveying knowledge is marvelously successful with the best men, but rather futile with the second best, that persons whose education has not enriched them with knowledge store up information, statistics, and other facts upon which they use their reasoning powers, that the attempt to reason without knowledge is disastrous, and that during the present distress England is, for various economical reasons, in a condition of intellectual inanition consequent upon a failure in her food supply, in this case the supply of food proper for the mind. I have glanced at knowledge under the three headings suggested by one who speaks with authority, and have contended that, even if the knowledge be divisible, the vehicle by which it is carried is one and indivisible and that it is generally impossible for the mind to receive knowledge except through the channel of letters. But the medieval mind had, as we know, a more satisfactory conception of knowledge than we have arrived at. Knowledge is for us a thing of shreds and patches, knowledge of this and of that, with yawning gaps between. The scholastic medieval mind, probably working on the scattered hints which the scriptures offer, worked out a sublime Philosophica della Religion Catalytica, pictured, for example, in the great fresco painted by Simone Memmi and Taddeo Gaddi, which Ruskin has taught us to know, and implied in The Adoration of the Lamb, painted by the two Van Eycks. In the first picture, we get a Pentecostal descent, first upon the cardinal virtues and the Christian graces, then upon prophets and apostles, and below these, upon the seven liberal arts represented each by its captain figure, Cicero, Aristotle, Zoroaster, etc., none of them Christian, not one of them a Hebrew. Here we get the magnificent idea that all knowledge, undebased, comes from above and is conveyed to minds which are, as Coleridge says, previously prepared to receive it, and further, that it comes to a mind so prepared, without question as to whether it be the mind of pagan or Christian, a truly liberal Catholic idea, it seems to me, 
corresponding marvelously with the facts of life. As sublime and even more explicit is the Promethean fable, which informed the Greek mind. With the sense of a sudden plunge, we come down to our own random and ineffectual notions, and are tempted to cry with Wordsworth, Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn, and know that a God had brought gifts of knowledge to men at awful cost, than to sit serene in the vague belief that knowledge arrives in incoherent particles. No one knows how and no one knows whence or that it is self-generated in a man here and there, who gets out of himself new insight into the motions of mind and heart, a new perception of the laws of life, the hint of a new amelioration in the condition of men. Because the notion that we entertain of knowledge as being heterogeneous lies at the root of our heterogeneous theories of education, it may be as well to quote a passage from Ruskin's description of that picture in the chapel of the Church of Santa Maria Novella, to which I have referred. On this side and the opposite side of the chapel are represented by Simon Memmi's hand, the teaching power of the Spirit of God, and the saving power of the Christ of God in the world, according to the understanding of Florence in his time. We will take the side of intellect first, beneath the pouring forth of the Holy Spirit in the point of the arch, beneath are the three evangelical virtues. Without these, says Florence, you can have no science, without love, faith, and hope, no intelligence. Under these are the four cardinal virtues, temperance, prudence, justice, fortitude. Under these are the great prophets and apostles. Under the line of prophets, as powers summoned by their voices, are the mythic figures of the seven theological or spiritual, and the seven geological or natural sciences, and under the feet of each of them, the figure of its captain teacher to the world. Mornings in Florence That is, the Florentines of the Middle Ages believed in the teaching power of the Spirit of God, believed not only that the seven liberal arts were fully under the direct outpouring of the Holy Ghost, but that every fruitful idea, every original conception, be it in geometry or grammar or music, was directly derived from a divine source. Whether we receive it or not, and the scriptures abundantly support such a theory regarding the occurrence of knowledge, we cannot fail to perceive that here, we have a harmonious and ennobling scheme of education and philosophy. It is a pity that the exigencies of his immediate work prevented Ruskin from inquiring further into the origin, the final source of knowledge. But we may continue the inquiry for ourselves. In The Teaching Power of the Spirit of God, we have a pregnant and inspiring phrase. Supposing that we accept this medieval philosophy tentatively for present relief, what would be our gains? First, the enormous relief afforded by a sense of unity of purpose, a progressive evolution, in the education of the race. It induces great ease of mind to think that knowledge is dealt out to us according to our preparedness and according to our needs, that God whispers in the ear of the man who is ready in order that he may be the vehicle to carry the new knowledge to the rest of us. God has a few of us whom he whispers in the ear. Apt Vogler is made to say, and another poet causes his explorer to cry, God chose me for his whisper, and I found it, and it's yours. Next, that knowledge in this light is no longer sacred and secular, great and trivial, practical and theoretical. All knowledge dealt out to us in such portions as we are ready for is sacred. Knowledge is perhaps a beautiful whole, a great unity, embracing God in man and the universe, but having many parts which are not comparable with one another in the sense of less or more, because all are necessary and each has its functions. Next, we proceed that knowledge and the mind of man are to each other as our air and the lungs. The mind lives by means of knowledge, stagnates, faints, 
parishes deprived of this necessary atmosphere, that it is not for a man to choose. I will learn this or that, the rest is not my concern. Still less is it for parent or schoolmaster to limit a child to less than he can get at of the whole field of knowledge, for in the domain of mind at least, as much as in that of morals or religion, man is under a divine master. He has to know as he has to eat that there is not one period of life, our school days, in which we sit down to regular meals of intellectual diet, but that we must eat every day in order to live every day. That knowledge and what is known as learning are not to be confounded. Learning may still be an available store when it is not knowledge, but by knowledge one grows, becomes more of a person, and that is all that there is to show for it. We sometimes wonder at the simplicity and modesty of persons whose knowledge is matter of repute. But they are not hiding their light. They are not aware of any unusual possessions. They have nothing to show but themselves. But we feel the force of their personalities. Now, forceful personalities, persons of weight and integrity, a decision and sound judgment, are what the country is most in need of. And if we propose to bring such persons up for the public service, the gradual inception of knowledge is one condition amongst others. There are various delightfully new educational systems in favor, in all of which a grain of knowledge is presented in a gallon of warm diluent. We have the theory that it does not matter what a child learns, but only how he learns it, which is as sound as it does not matter what a child eats, but only how he eats it. Therefore, feed him on sawdust. Then we have Rousseau's primitive man theory, that a child must get all his knowledge through his own senses and by his own wits, as if there were no knowledge waiting to be passed on by the small torch-bearer. And there is the theory which obtained in Catholic England exemplified in more than one of the Waverley novels, in the sports purveyed for her tenantry by Lady Margaret Bellenden, for example. Those men and maidens had been trained as children to be supple, active, healthy, with senses alert, ready for dance and song, with an eye and ear ready for the beautiful, intelligent, happy, capable. I quote from a valuable letter in The Times. What with our Morris dances, pageants, living pictures, miracle plays, and so on, we are reviving the steward educational ideals, and no doubt we will do well to aim at increasing the general joy. But our age requires more of us, in the sort of self-activity and self-expression implied in these and in half a dozen other educational theories. Knowledge plays no part, and the city gammon, exhibits in perfection every quality of gaiety, alert intelligence, delight in shows, which we set ourselves to cultivate. With all thy getting, get understanding, is the message for our needs, and understanding is, in one sense, the conscious act of the mind in apprehending knowledge, which is in fact relative, and does not exist for any person until that person's mind acts upon the intellectual matter presented to it. Why will ye not understand? is the repeated and poignant question of the Gospels. That is what ails us as a nation. We do not understand. Not ignorant persons only, but educated men and women employ fallacious arguments, offer prejudices for principles, and platitudes for ideas. If it be argued that these failures are due less to ignorance than to insincerity, I should reply that insincerity is an outcome of ignorance. The darkened intelligence cannot see clearly. The day is unto them that know, but knowledge is by no means the facile acquirement of those who, according to Ruskin, cram to pass and not to know. I would not be understood as passing strictures upon the vast and excellent educational work nearly all teachers are doing. 
It is impossible to go into an elementary school without being impressed by the competence of the teachers and the intelligence of the children. I have already paid a worthless tribute to public schools and should like here to add a word of affectionate and hearty appreciation of the high school girl as I know her, thoughtful and well-educated, a person quite undeserving of the slings and arrows of outrageous criticism too freely aimed at her. As for our new universities, they remove the stigma under which many of us have suffered in presence of the numerous centers of intellectual life, which add dignity and grace to continental cities. The new universities are full of promise for the land. We have, no doubt, arrived at a good starting place. We may not consider that the journey is accomplished. I need not repeat the charges to which we have laid ourselves open because of our ignorance but I shall endeavor to take a closer survey of the field of education as regarded from the standpoint of knowledge and the innate affinities existing in the mind with that knowledge, which is proper for it. For the present, the need is that abstract knowledge should present itself to practical persons as the crying demand of the nation. The mandate, let us say, pronounced by certain general failures to understand the science of relations, and that other neglected form of knowledge, the science of the proportion of things. Section 28 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Home Education Series, Volume 6. Towards a Philosophy of Education by Charlotte Mason The Basis of National Strength A Liberal Education from a National Standpoint 5 Education and the Fullness of Time I must live my life, said the notorious bandit who before the war terrorized Paris, and we have heard this sort of cant often, even before the doll's house, gave to self-expression the dignity of a cult. Nevertheless, the brigand Bonnot has done an ill turn to society, for a misguiding theory, neatly put, is more dangerous than an ill example. We are tired of the man who claims to live his life at the general expense, of the girl who will live hers to her family's annoyance or distress. But there really is a great opportunity open to the nation which will set itself to consider what the life of a man should be and will give each individual a chance to live his life. We are doing something. We are trying to open the book of nature to children by the proper key. Knowledge, acquaintance by look and name, if not more, with bird and flower and tree. We see, too, that the magic of poetry makes knowledge vital, and children and grown-ups Quote a verse which shall add blackness to the ash bud, tender wonder to that flower in the cranny wall, a thrill to the song of the lark. As for the numerous field clubs of the northern towns, the members of which, weavers, miners, artisans, reveal themselves as accomplished botanists, birdmen, geologists, their Saturday rambles mean not only life, but splendid joy. It is to be hoped that the opportunities afforded in the schools will prepare women to take more part in these excursions. At present, the work done is too thorough for their endurance and for their slight attainments. In another direction, we are doing well. We are so made that every dynamic relation, be it leapfrog or high-flying, which we establish with Mother Earth, is a cause of joy. We begin to see this and are encouraging swimming, dancing, hockey, and so on, all instruments of present joy and permanent health. Again, we know that the human hand is a wonderful and exquisite instrument to be used in a hundred movements exacting delicacy, direction, and force. Every such movement is a cause of joy as it leads to the pleasure of execution and the triumph of success. We begin to understand this and make some efforts to train the young in the deft handling of tools and the practice of handicrafts. Someday, perhaps, 
we shall see apprenticeship to trades revived and good and beautiful work enforced. In so far, we are laying ourselves out to secure that each shall live his life and that not at his neighbor's expense. Because so wonderful is the economy of the world that when a man really lives his life, he benefits his neighbor as well as himself. We all thrive in the well-being of each. We are perceiving, too, that a human being is endowed with an ear attuned to harmony and melody, with a voice from which music may issue, hands whose delicate action may draw forth sounds and enthralling sequence. With the ancient Greeks, we begin to realize that music is a necessary part of education. So, too, a pictorial art. At last we understand that everyone can draw, and that, because to draw is delightful, everyone should be taught how, that everyone delights in pictures, and that education is concerned to teach him what pictures to delight in. A person may sing and dance, enjoy music and natural beauty, sketch what he sees, have satisfaction in his own good craftsmanship, labor with his hands at honest work, perceiving that work is better than wages, may live his life in various directions, the more the merrier. A certain pleasant play of the intellect attends the doing of all these things. His mind is agreeably exercised. He thinks upon what he is doing, often with excitement, sometimes with enthusiasm. He says, I must live my life and he lives it in as many of these ways as are open to him. No other life is impoverished to supply his fullness, but, on the contrary, the sum of general joy in well-being is increased, both through sympathy and by imitation. This is the sort of ideal that is obtaining in our schools and in the public mind, so that the next generation bid fair to be provided with many ways of living their lives ways which do not encroach upon the lives of others. Here is the contribution of our generation to the science of education, and it is not an unworthy one. We perceive that a person is to be brought up in the first place for his own uses, and after that for the uses of society. But, as a matter of fact, the person who lives his life most completely is also of most service to others because he contains within himself provision for many serviceable activities which are employed in living his life. And besides, there is a negative advantage to the community in the fact that the man is able to live on his own resources. But a man is not made up of only eyes to see, a heart to enjoy, limbs delightful in the using, hands satisfied with perfect execution. Life in all these kinds is open more or less to all but the idly depraved. But what of man's eager, hungry, restless, insatiable mind? True, we teach him the mechanical art of reading while he is at school, but we do not teach him to read. He has little power of attention, a poor vocabulary, little habit of conceiving any life but his own. To add to the gate money at a football match is his notion of adventure and diversion. We are, in fact, only taking count of the purlieus of that vast domain which pertains to every man in right of his human nature. We neglect mind. We need not consider brain. A duly nourished and duly exercised mind takes care of its physical organ, provided that organ also receives its proper material nourishment. But our fault, our exceeding great fault, is that we keep our own minds and the minds of our children shamefully underfed. The mind is a spiritual octopus, reaching out limbs in every direction to draw in enormous rations of that which, under the action of the mind itself, becomes knowledge. Nothing can steal its infinite variety. The heavens and the earth, the past, the present and future, things great and things minute, Nations and men, the universe, all are within the scope of the human intelligence. But there would appear to be, as we have seen, an unsuspected, unwritten law 
concerning the nature of the material, which is converted into knowledge during the act of apprehension. The idea of the logos did not come by chance to the later Greeks. The word is not a meaningless title applied to the second person of the Trinity. It is not without significance that every utterance which fell from him is marked by exquisite literary fitness. A child's comment on a hymn that was read to her was, That is not poetry. Jesus would have said it much better. In rendering an account of his august commission, Christ said, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. And one disciple voiced the rest when he said, Thou hast the words of eternal life. The Greeks knew better than we that words are more than things, more than events. With all primitive people, rhetoric appears to have been a power. The grand old sayings which we have scorned as inventions are coming to their own again, because what modern is capable of such inventions? Men move the world, but the motives which move men are conveyed by words. Now a person is limited by the number of things he is able to call by their names, qualify by appropriate epithets. This is no mere pedantic ruling. It belongs to that unfathomable mystery we call human nature. And the modern notion of education, with its shibboleth of things not words, is intrinsically demoralizing. The human intelligence demands letters, literature, with a more than bread hunger. It is almost within living memory how the newly emancipated American Negroes fell upon books as the famished Israelites fell upon food in the deserted camp of Sennacherib. Only as he has been and is nourished upon books is a man able to live his life. A great deal of mechanical labor is necessarily performed in solitude. The miner, the farm laborer, cannot think all the time of the block he is hewing, the furrow he is plowing. How good that he should be figuring to himself the trial scene in the heart of Midlothian, the hijinks in Guy Mannering, that his imagination should be playing with Anne Page or Mrs. Quickly, or that his labor goes the better because his secret soul a holy strain repeats. People, working people, do these things, Many a one can say, out of a rich experience, my mind to me a kingdom is. Many a one cries with Browning's Paracelsus, God, thou art mind. Unto the master mind, mind should be precious. Spare my mind alone. We know how half mind appears on the tiles paving the choir of St. Cross. But mind, like body, must have its meat. Faith has grown feeble in these days. Hope faints in our heavy ways. But charity waxes strong. We would make all men millionaires if we could, or at any rate, take from the millionaires to give to the multitude. No doubt some beneficent and adventurous Robin Hood of a minister will arise, has arisen, to take steps in that direction. But when all has been done in the way of social amelioration, we shall not have enabled men to live their lives, unless we have given them a literary education of such sort that they choose to continue in the pleasant places of the mind. That is all very well in theory, someone objects. But look at the masses. Are they able to receive letters? When they talk, it is in journalese and anything in the nature of a book must be watered down and padded to suit their comprehension. But is it not true that working men talk in journalese? Because it is only the newspapers that do them the grace to meet them frankly on their own level. Neither school education nor life has put books in their way, and their adoption of the only literary speech that offers but proves a natural aptitude for letters. One cannot always avoid appeal to the authority one knows to be final, and I will not apologize for citing the fact at which, no doubt we have all wondered that Christ should expose the profoundest philosophy to the multitude, the many, whom even Socrates contemns. 
may I quote, with apologies to the writer, a letter signed, A Working Man, written in answer to one of mine, which was honored by being reprinted in the Times Weekly Edition. It is good, by the way, that such a journal should be in the hands of working men. My correspondent thanks heaven that there are still a few persons left in this country who regard education as somewhat different from a means of keeping a shop. We may all thank heaven that there are working men who value knowledge for its own sake and hate to have it presented to them as a means of getting on. The fact is, letters make a universal appeal because they respond to certain innate affinities. Young Tennyson's, De Quincey's, and the like are, as we all know, inordinate readers, but these are capable of foraging on their own account. It is for the average, the dull, and the backward boy. I would lay urgent claim to a literary education. The minds of such as these respond to this and to no other appeal, and they turn out perfectly intelligent persons, open to knowledge by many avenues, for working men whose intelligence is in excess of their education. Letters are the accessible vehicle of knowledge. Having learned the elements of reading, writing, and summing, it is unnecessary to trouble them with any other beggarly elements. Their natural intelligence and mature minds make them capable of dealing with difficulties as they occur. And for further elucidation, every working man's club should have an encyclopedia. Some men naturally take to learning and will struggle manfully with their Latin grammar. And Cicero, their Euclid and trigonometry, happy they. But the general conclusion remains that for men and women of all ages, all classes, and all complexions of mind. Letters are an imperative and daily requirement to satisfy that universal mind hunger, the neglect of which gives rise to emotional disturbances and, as a consequence, to evils that dismay us. Section 29 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Marie Christian. Home Education Series, Volume 6, Towards a Philosophy of Education, by Charlotte Mason. The Basis of National Strength, a Liberal Education from a National Standpoint. 6. Knowledge in Literary Form. I have so far urged that knowledge is necessary to men, and that, in the initial stages, it must be conveyed through a literary medium, whether it be knowledge of physics or of letters, because there would seem to be some inherent quality in mind which prepares it to respond to this form of appeal, and no other. I say in the initial stages, because possibly, when the mind becomes conversant with knowledge of a given type, it unconsciously translates the driest formula into living speech. Perhaps it is for some such reason that mathematics seems to fall outside this rule of literary presentation. Mathematics, like music, is a speech in itself, a speech irrefragably logical, of exquisite clarity, meeting the requirements of mind. To consider letters as the staple of education is no new thing, nor is the suggestion new that to turn a young person into a library is to educate him. But here we are brought to a stand. The mind demands method, orderly presentation, as inevitably as it demands knowledge. And it may be that our educational misadventures are due to the fact that we have allowed ourselves to take up any haphazard ordering that is recommended with sufficient pertinacity. But no one can live without a philosophy which points out the order, means and end of effort, intellectual or other. To fail in discovering this is to fall into melancholia, or more active madness. So we go about picking up a maxim here, a motto there, an idea elsewhere, and make a patchwork of the whole, which we call our principles. 
beggarly fragments enough we piece together to cover our nakedness and a hundred phrases which one may hear any day betray lives founded upon an ignoble philosophy no doubt people are better than their words better than their own thoughts we speak of ourselves as finite beings but is there any limit to the generosity and nobility of almost any person the hastily spoken it is the rule at sea that distressed us a while ago what a vista does it disclose of chivalric tenderness entire self-sacrifice human nature has not failed what has failed us is philosophy and that applied philosophy which is called education philosophy all the philosophies old and new land us on the horns of a dilemma either we do well by ourselves and seek our own perfection of nature or condition or we do well by others to our own loss or deterioration if there is a mean philosophy does not declare it there are things of which we have desperate need we want a new scale of values i suppose we all felt when in those days before the war we read how several millionaires went down in the titanic disaster not only that their millions did not matter but that they did not matter to them that possibly they felt themselves well quit of an incessant fatigue we want more life there is not life enough for our living we have no great engrossing interests we hasten from one engagement to another and glance furtively at the clock to see how time life is getting on we triumph if a week seems to have passed quickly who knows but that the approach of an inevitable end might find us glad to get it all over we want hope we busy ourselves excitedly about some object of desire but the pleasure we get is in effort not in attainment and we read before the war of the number of suicides among continental schoolboys for instance with secret understanding what is there to live for we want to be governed servants like to receive their orders soldiers and schoolboys enjoy discipline there is satisfaction in stringent court etiquette the fact of being under orders adds dignity to character when we revolt it is only that we may transfer our allegiance we want a new start we are sick of ourselves and of knowing in advance how we shall behave and how we shall feel on all occasions the change we half unconsciously desire is to other aims other ways of looking at things we feel that we are more than there is room for other conditions might give us room we don't know anyway we are uneasy these are two or three of the secret matters that oppress us and we are in need of a philosophy which shall deal with such things of the spirit we believe we should be able to rise to its demands however exigent for the failure is not in us or in human nature so much as in our limited knowledge of conditions the cry of decadence is dispiriting but is it well founded the beautiful little gowns that have come down as heirlooms would not fit thee divinely tall daughters of many a house where they are treasured we have become frank truthful kind our conscientiousness and our charity are morbid we cannot rest in our beds for a disproportionate anxiety for the well-being of everybody we even exceed the generous hazard that per adventure for a good man one might be found to die almost any man will risk his life for the perishing without question of good or bad and we expect no less from firemen doctors lifeboatmen parsons the general public and what a comment on the splendid magnanimity of men does the war afford an annoying inquiry concerning risks at sea almost resulted in a ruling that no one should let himself be saved so long as others were in danger it is preposterous but is what human nature expects of itself no we are not decadent on the whole and our uneasiness is perhaps caused by growing pains we may be poor things but we are ready to break forth into singing should the chance open to us of a full life of passionate devotion 
Now, all our exigent demands are met by words written in a book and by the manifestations of a person. And we are waiting for a Christianity such as the world has not yet known. Hitherto, Christ has existed for our uses. But what if a time were coming when we also should taste the oriental fragrance of my master? So it shall be when the shout of a king is among us, and are there not premonitions? But these things come not by prayer and fasting, by good works and self-denial alone. There is something prior to all these upon which our master insists with distressful urgency. Why will ye not know? Why will ye not understand? My excuse for touching upon our most intimate concerns is that this matter, too, belongs to the domain of letters. If we propose to seek knowledge, we must proceed in an orderly way, recognizing that the principal knowledge is of most importance. The present writer writes and the reader reads, because we are all moved by the spirit of our time. These things are our secret preoccupation, for we have come out of a long alienation as persons, wearied with trifles, and are ready and anxious for a new age. We know the way, and we know where to find our rule of the road. But we must bring a new zeal and a new method to our studies. We may no longer dip here and there, or read a perfunctory chapter with a view to find some word of counsel or comfort for our use. We are engaged in the study of, in noting the development of, that consummate philosophy which meets every occasion of our lives, all demands of the intellect, every uneasiness of the soul. The arrogance which pronounces judgment upon the written word upon so slight an acquaintance as would hardly enable us to cover a sheet or two of paper with sayings of the master which confines the divine teaching to the great sermon of which we are able to rehearse some half dozen sentences is as absurd as it is blameworthy let us give at least as profound attention to the teaching of christ as the disciples of plato say gave to his words of wisdom let us observe, notebook in hand, the orderly and progressive sequence, the penetrating quality, the irresistible appeal, the unique content of the divine teaching. For this purpose, it might be well to use some one of the approximately chronological arrangements of the gospel history in the words of the text. Let us read not for our profiting, though that will come, but for love of that knowledge which is better than thousands of gold and silver. By and by we perceive that this knowledge is the chief thing in life, the meaning of Christ's saying, Behold, I make all things new, dawns upon us. We get new ideas as to the relative worth of things, new vigor, new joy, new hope are ours. If we believe that knowledge is the principal thing, that knowledge is tripartite, and that the fundamental knowledge is the knowledge of God, we shall bring up our children as students of divinity, and shall pursue our own lifelong studies in the same school. Then we shall find that the weekly sermons for which we are prepared are as bread to the hungry and we shall perhaps understand how enormous is the demand we make upon the clergy for living original thought. It is only as we are initiated that science and nature come to our aid in this chief pursuit. Then they their great original proclaim, but while we are ignorant of the principal knowledge, they remain dumb. Literature and history have always great matters to speak of or suggest, because they deal with states or phases of moral government and moral anarchy, and tacitly indicate to us the sole key to all this unintelligible world. And literature not only reveals to us the deepest things of the human spirit, but it is profitable also for example of life and instruction in manners. We are at the parting of the ways, our latest educational authority, one who knows and loves little children, would away with all tales and histories that appeal to the imagination. Let children learn by means of things, is her mandate. 
and the charm and tenderness with which it is delivered may well blind us to its desolating character. We recognize Rousseau, of course, and his Emile, that self-sufficient person who should know nothing of the past, should see no visions, allow no authority. But human nature in children is stronger than the 18th century philosopher and the theories which he continues to inform. Whoever has told a fairy tale to a child has been made aware of that natural appetency for letters to which it is our business to minister. Are we not able to believe that words are more than meat? And, so believing, shall we not rise up and insist that children shall have a liberal diet of the spirit? Rousseau, in spite of false analogies, fallacious arguments, was able to summon fashionable mothers and men of the world throughout Europe to the great task of education, because his eloquence convinced them that this was their assigned work and a work capable of achievement. And we who perhaps see with clearer eyes should do well to cherish this legacy, the conviction that the education of the succeeding generation is the chief business of every age. Nevertheless, Though we are ourselves emerging from the slough of materialism, we are willing to plunge children into its heavy ways through the agency of a practical and useful education. But children have their rights, and among these is the freedom of the city of mind. Let them use things, know things, learn through things, by all means. But the more they know letters, the better they will be able, with due instruction, to handle things. I do not hesitate to say that the whole of a child's instruction should be conveyed through the best literary medium available. His history book should be written with the lucidity, concentration, personal conviction, directness, and admirable simplicity which characterizes a work of literary caliber. So should his geography books. The so-called scientific method of teaching geography, now in vogue, is calculated to place a child in a somewhat priggish relation to Mother Earth. It is impossible, too, that the human intelligence should assimilate the sentences one meets with in many books for children, but the memory retains them and the child is put in the false attitude of one who offers pseudo-knowledge. Most of the geography books, for example, require to be translated into terms of literature before they can be apprehended. Great confidence is placed in diagrammatic and pictorial representation, and it is true that children enjoy diagrams and understand them as they enjoy and understand puzzles, but there is apt to be in their minds a great gulf between the diagram and the fact it illustrates. We trust much to pictures, lantern slides, cinematograph displays. But without labor there is no profit, and probably the pictures which remain with us are those which we have first conceived through the medium of words. Pictures may help us to correct our notions, but the imagination does not work upon a visual presentation. We lay the phrases of a description on our palette and make our own pictures. Works of art belong to another category. We recollect how Dr. Arnold was uneasy until he got details enough to form a mental picture of a place new to him. So it is with children and all persons of original mind. A map to put the place in position, and then, all about it, is what we want. Readings in literature, whether of prose or poetry, should generally illustrate the historical period studied. But selection should be avoided. Children should read the whole book or the whole poem to which they are introduced. Here we are confronted by a serious difficulty. Plato, we know, determined that the poets in his Republic should be well looked after lest they should write matter to corrupt the morals of youth. Aware of what happened in Europe when the floodgates of knowledge were opened, Erasmus was anxiously solicitous on this score and it is a little surprising to find that here Rossetti was on the side of the angels. Will the publishers, who, since Friedrich Perthes discovered their educational mission, have done so much for the world, help us in this matter also? They must excise with a most sparing hand, 
always under the guidance of a jealous scholar. But what an ease of conscience it would be to teachers if they could throw open the world of books to their scholars without fear of the mental and moral smudge left by a single purient passage. Many, too, who have taken out their freedom in the Republic of Letters would be well content to keep complete library editions in costly bindings in their proper place, while handy volumes in daily use might be left about without uneasiness. The Old Testament itself, after such a very guarded process, would be more available for the reading of children and few persons would feel that Shakespeare's plays suffered from the removal of obscenities here and there. In this regard we cherish a too superstitious piety. In another matter, let that great remedial thinker, Dr. Arnold, advise us. Adjust your proposed amount of reading to your time and inclination, but whether that amount be large or small, let it be varied in its kind, and widely varied. If I have a confident opinion on any one point connected with the improvement of the human mind, it is on this. Here we get support for a varied and liberal curriculum, and as a matter of fact, we find that the pupil who studies a number of subjects knows them as well as he who studies a few knows those few. Children should read books not about books and about authors. This sort of reading may be left for the spare hours of the dilettante. Their reading should be carefully ordered, for the most part in historical sequence. They should read to know, whether it be Robinson Crusoe or Huxley's physiography. Their knowledge should be tested, not by questions, but by the oral, and occasionally the written, reproduction of a passage after one reading. All further processes that we concern ourselves about in teaching, the mind performs for itself. And, lastly, this sort of reading should be the chief business in the classroom. We are at a crucial moment in the history of English education. John Bull is ruminating. He says, I have labored at the higher education of women. Let them back to the cooking pot and distaff and learn the science of domestic economy. I have tried for these forty years to educate the children of the people. What is the result? Strikes and swelled head. Let them have prentice schools and learn what will be their business in life. John Bull is wrong. In so far as we have failed, it is that we have offered the pedantry, the more verbiage, of knowledge in lieu of knowledge itself and it is time for all who do not hold knowledge in contempt to be up and doing. There is time yet to save England and to make of her a greater nation, more worthy of her opportunities. But the country of our love will not stand still. If we let the people sink into the mire of a material education, our doom is sealed. Eyes now living will see us take even a third-rate place among the nations, for it is knowledge that exalteth a nation, because out of duly ordered knowledge proceedeth righteousness, and prosperity ensueth. Think clear, feel deep, bear fruit well, says our once familiar mentor, Matthew Arnold, and his monition exactly meets our needs. Section 30 of Home Education Series, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Brooke Favorite, alongsidemom.com. Home Education Series, Volume 6, Towards a Philosophy of Education, by Charlotte Mason. Section 30, Too Wide a Mesh. Supplementary, Too Wide a Mesh. The wide world dreaming on things to come is concentrating on a luminous figure of education which it beholds, dimly, emerging from a cloudy horizon. This gracious presence is to change the world, to give to all men wider possibilities, other thoughts, aims. But alas, this education which is to be open to all promises no more a nearer view than to make opportunity universal. That is, in spiritual things, he may take who has the power, and he may keep who can. The net is cast wide, no doubt, and brings in a mighty haul, but the meshes are so wide that it will only retain big fishes. 
Now, this is the history of education since the world was and is no new thing. The medieval schools of Castle or Abbey, the Renaissance schools, the very schools of China, have all been conducted upon this plan. Education is for him who wants it and can take it, but is no universal boon like the air we breathe or the sunshine we revel in. We are a little sorry for the effect of this limitation upon the working classes. Only a small percentage of the children of these are big enough to be retained in the examination net, which, to do it justice, explores all waters. A few of the past men may do big things and fill big posts, but for the rest a large percentage is, in practice, illiterate except for the spelling out of a local rag for football and parish news. But is the mischief confined to what we call the working classes? Is it not a fact that in most schools the full force of instruction is turned on upon a few boys who are likely to distinguish themselves? While for the rest of the school teaching is duly given, no doubt, but the boys find they may take it or leave it as the humor takes them. We were all fascinated a while ago by the story of a pair of charming twins. These went through the usual preparatory school education and then passed on to a great public school, where they remained until they were nineteen. That is, they had ten or twelve good years among most excellent opportunities. As they were attractive boys, we may take it that their masters were not at any rate unwilling to teach them. Their record should have been quite a good one, and though it is the fashion to sneer a little at public schools, we know that these have turned out and do turn out the best and most intellectual men the country has occasion for. Therefore, what happened in the case of these twins does not cast any reflection upon public schools, but solely upon the system of the big mesh. Here are some of the things we read in that delightful biography. While in hospital after a mash at Polo, R. wrote to F., I enjoyed it immensely. What lucky people we are taking an interest in so many things. Surely, here was material for a schoolmaster to work upon. Again, we read, They never ceased to wonder at the magnificence of the world, and they carried a divine innocence into soldiering and travel and sport and business, and, not least, into the shadows of the great war. And this wonder of theirs was the note that marked them at school. Again, what material for their instructors! But, we read, at X they showed little interest in books, and later were wont to lament to each other that they had left school wholly uneducated. The italics are ours. Their kindly biographer and dear friend goes on to say, But they learnt other things, the gift of leadership, for instance, and the power of getting alongside all varieties of human nature. But was not this nature rather than nurture, school nurture at any rate, for these gifts seem to have been a family inheritance. Born in 1880, they left school in 1899, where there follows a delightful record for the one brother of successful and adventurous sport, while R. was soon absorbed in the city, and beginning to lament his want of education. F., while in Egypt, was greatly impressed by Lord Cromer, and writes to R., He is quite the biggest man we have. To hear him talk is worth hearing. The two brothers correspond constantly, and R. takes the part of mentor to his brother. He advises him to learn the Times leaders by heart and to improve his style, because they are very good English. Again, I will send you out next mail a very good book, Science and Education, by Professor Huxley, which I have marked in several places, the sort of book you can read over again. R. had discovered that he was very badly educated and was determined to remedy this defect. It don't matter, I do believe not having learned at X, so long as one does so now. See the fine loyalty of the young man. His failures were not to be put down to his school. If the schools take credit for any one thing, it is that they show their pupils how to learn. But do they? We are told that R. set to work at a queer assortment of books and writes to F. Anyone can improve his memory. The best way is by learning by heart, no matter what. And then when you think you know it, say it or write it. After two or three days, you are sure to forget it again, and then instead of looking at the book, strain your mind and try to remember it. Above all things, always keep your mind employed. One great man, I forget which, used to see a number on a door, say 69, and tried to remember all that had happened in the years ending in 69. Or see a horse and remember how many you have seen that day. Asquith always learns things by heart. He never wastes a minute. As soon as he has nothing to do, he picks up some book. 
he reads till one thirty every night. When driving to the temple next morning, he thinks over what he has read. Result, he has a marvelous memory and knows everything. Think of the Herculean labors the poor fellow set for both himself and his brother. They ran an intellectual race across a plowed field after heavy rain, and the marvel is that they made way at all. Yet these two brothers had sufficient intellectual zeal to have made them great men as ambassadors, governors of dominions, statesmen, what not. Whereas so far as things of the mind go, they spent their days in a hopeless struggle, alert for any indication which might help them to make up leeway. And all because, according to their own confession, they had learned nothing at school. Here are further indications of R's labor in the field of knowledge. I am reading Roseberry's Napoleon and will send it to you. What a wonder he was! Never spent a moment of his life without learning something. I enclose an essay from Bacon's book. Learn it by heart if you can. I have and think it a clinker. I have also finished Life of Macaulay. I have always wondered how our great politicians and literary chaps live. I also send you a Shakespeare. I learnt Antony's harangue to the Romans after Caesar's death. I am also trying to learn a little about electricity and railroad organization, so have my time filled up. Pickwick papers I also send to you. I have always avoided this sort of books, but Dickens' works are miles funnier than the rotten novels one sees. I have learnt one thing by my reading and my conversation with professors. You and I go at a subject all wrong. Italics ours. These letters are pathetic documents, and that they are reassuring also, let us be thankful. They do go to prove that the desire of knowledge is inextinguishable, whatever schools do or leave undone. But have these nothing to answer for when a pursuit, which should yield ever-recurring refreshment, becomes dogged labor over heavy roads with little pleasure in progress? Here again is another evidence of the limitations attending an utter absence of education. A cultivated sense of humor is a great factor in a joyous life, but these young men are without it. Perhaps the youth addicted to sports usually fails to appreciate delicate nonsense. Sports are too strenuous to admit of a subtler, more airy kind of play. And we read, R. heard Mr. Balfour and Lord Ray praising Alice in Wonderland. Deeply impressed, he bought the book as soon as he returned to London and read it earnestly. To his horror, he saw no sense in it. Then it struck him that it might be meant as nonsense, and he had another try, when he concluded that it was rather funny, but he remained disappointed. We need not follow the career of these interesting men further. Both fell early before they were forty. Their fine qualities and their personal fascination remained with them to the end, as did also, alas, their invincible ignorance. They labored indefatigably, but as R. remarked, you and I go at a subject all wrong. The schools must tell us why men who attained mediocre successes and the personal favor due to charming manners and sweet natures were yet somewhat depressed and disappointed on account of the ignorance which they made blind and futile efforts to correct. But they never got so far as to learn that knowledge is delightful because one likes it, and that no effort at self-education can do anything until one has found out this supreme delightfulness of knowledge. It must be noted that this failure of a great school to fulfill its purpose occurred twenty years ago, and that no educational body has made more well-considered and enlightened advances than have the headmasters of the great public schools. Probably that delightful group of Eton boys in Coningsby has always been and is today typical. There is a certain knightly character in the fine bearing and intelligent countenances of the head boys one comes across there which speaks well for their intellectual activity. The question is whether more might not be done with the average boy. The function of the schools is no doubt to feed their scholars on knowledge until they have created in them a healthy appetite which they will go on satisfying for themselves day by day throughout life. We must give up the farce of teaching young people how to learn which is just as felicitous a labor and just as necessary as to teach a child the motions of eating without offering him food. The studies which are pursued with a view to improve the mind must in future take a back seat. The multitudinous things that every person wants to know must be made accessible in the schoolroom, not by diagrams, digests, and abstract principles, but boys and girls, like Kit's little brother, must learn what oysters is by supping on oysters. There is absolutely no avenue to knowledge but knowledge itself. And the schools must begin, not by qualifying the mind to deal with knowledge, 
but by affording all the best books containing all the sorts of knowledge which these twins, like everyone else, wanted to know. We have to face two difficulties. We do not believe in children as intellectual persons, nor in knowledge as requisite and necessary for intellectual life. It is a pity that education is conducted in camera, save for the examination lists which shew how the best pupils in a school have acquitted themselves, the half dozen or dozen best in a big school. Finely conscientious as teachers are, they can hardly fail to give undue importance to their group of candidates for examination, and a school of four or five hundred stands or falls by a dozen head boys. End of section 30. End of Home Education Series, Volume 6, Towards a Philosophy of Education by Charlotte Mason.